Hello, everyone, and welcome to week six of the 18th annual Symposium on the Conservation and Biology of Tortoises and Freshwater Turtles. Today's two sessions are Western Pond Turtles and Invasive Species. And here to kick things off for us all the way from Nevada is Mark Enders presenting for Jason Jones. Thank you, and you guys enjoy. All right, good morning, everybody. So my name is Mark Enders. I'm with Nevada Department of Wildlife. And this morning, I get to kick things off with two talks. Uh, first, I'll be filling in for my colleague, Jason Jones, who couldn't make it today. And uh, our first talk is basically a historical review of Western pond turtles in the state of Nevada, um, trying to evaluate the evidence on whether the species is native or not, because there is still uh, some debate about that in the scientific community. So the Western pond turtles history is somewhat convoluted, which is evident in its name. The Western or Pacific pond or mud turtle or terrapin the species has undergone multiple genera changes in the past century. And the variable nomenclature used has only made life harder for those of us who sleuth for the truth. Uh, the Western pond turtles distribution historically extended along the West Coast from British Columbia to Baja, California. And there are a few disjunct populations, including those in Nevada, where it's largely been noted as an introduced species in some of the literature. So, now we're gonna embark on the historical review of Nevada's Western pond turtles. And we go back to a long time ago when a couple of gentlemen, a Pennsylvanian named Spencer Baird and a Frenchman named Charles Gerard hopped on a boat together and headed towards Washington state. And at the same time, a man from Russia, we'll call him Mr. W this morning, uh, hopped on a boat and floated to California. And it was in 1841 that Baird and Gerard found themselves in the Puget Sound, where they caught a Western pond turtle, which actually became the type specimen. But it took them 11 years to publish that information, so more than a decade. And meanwhile, our Russian ally also caught a Western pond turtle on what is now known as the Russian River. But it takes 21 years for somebody else to actually publish that information. So publications take decades, and I suppose that's good news for anybody still waiting to publish any grad school work maybe. But for historical context, around that same time that those first pond turtles were being captured for science, President William Henry Harrison died right after inauguration, and it took 110 days for people in California to learn about that. So we're not exactly talking about the golden age of information here. And it wasn't for 20 more years until the first transcontinental telegraph was completed in 1861. So information sharing was orders of magnitude slower back at this time, or you could say it moved at a tortoise's pace. So at the same time of the Russian River publication and the transcontinental telegraph completion, a physician and naturalist named J.G. Cooper publishes about pond turtles in three locations including the Carson Valley in Nevada along the Carson River. So he puts Nevada on the pond turtle map less than 10 years after the first pond turtle description by Baird and Gerard. And given that info traveled so slow at that time, it's really hard to say when Nevada's turtles were actually first observed, but based on our previous examples, it was likely a decade, which puts us around the time of Nevada's first white settlement called Genoa, which was actually established by Mormon immigrants moving west towards California, not from California. So those folks would not have had any pond turtles with them. In 1859, right before Cooper's publication hits the streets, we see a major migration of upwards of tens of thousands of miners, immigrants, merchants, moving into Nevada from California after the discovery of the Comstock Lode. So, Right there, that greatly accelerated the trade of goods between California and Nevada. 
And that became very evident more than a decade after that when you begin to see reports coming in from newspapers noting turtles and other fancy game shipments. And if you ever get a chance to look through old microfiche, you really should. Now there's everything that modern newspapers would publish now and more, uh, neighborhood gossip, tales of kids wrangling rattlesnakes, even the contents of your Wells Fargo order printed right there in the newspaper for everyone to look at. Uh, but as illustrated here in 1871, the earliest mention of turtles coming into the Carson River drainage is from the Gold Hill Daily News, which notes a dozen terrapins and bullfrogs arrived from to Virginia City from Winnemucca, which is actually 200 miles east, so also not pond turtle country. So who knows what species those were, but these new news articles regarding individual boxes of undescribed terrapins continue to be delivered for the next few decades. And most interestingly, we see a larger, more concerted effort emerge from Nevada's very own fish commissioner, W.M. Carey in the late 1880s. So in 1889, Carey reports that for the past two years, he's basically been Johnny Apple seeding eatable terrapins across the state of Nevada. And during all of our sleuthing, we were only able to account for about a quarter of those turtles that he released. But then La Rivers notes in his 1962 Fish and Fisheries of Nevada book that the species of terrapins that Carey was distributing were of unknown origin and species. And so it could have been another common eatable terrapin like a diamondback or snapping turtle, but really who knows. However, in an 1887 newspaper article, it's reported that 16 of these turtles that Kerry released in the Carson River originated from the Sacramento Valley, which is pond turtle country. But then the article goes on to say that these turtles would grow to over 10 pounds, which makes them way, way bigger than any pond turtle ever caught. And I find it comical that two months later, eatable and toothsome terrapins apparently have reached a size of 260 pounds in the Carson River, as reported by both the Elko Free Press and the Eureka Sentinel. And so obviously that's either false or an epic fisherman's tale about an introduced species like the snapper, or maybe it's a legit record of an exotic species like this Chinese uh, soft shell that can actually get that big. So although these are likely exaggerations or miscitings, I find it intriguing that miscitations persist now with regard to Nevada's Western pond turtles, even in recent times with white papers in Washington and Oregon and one of the most cited genetic studies on pond turtles, all miscitating Carey's 1889 publication as an 1887 publication. So maybe adding further insult to injury, these publications um, continue to be used as evidence that pond turtles are likely introduced into Nevada. And I think this claim was really furthered by the rivers in 1942, who clearly speculates that pond turtle introduction occurred in the late 1800s in his reptile and amph amphibian publication of the time. Interestingly, he fails to cite Carey at all, despite his extensive re reviews of the fish commissioner's reports for his book, but I think that's enough uh, trash talking of dead people. We'll move on to 1963, when Benjamin Ban Banta finally brings back to light Cooper's century old publication of pond turtles in the Carson Valley. Uh, but he notes pond turtles occurring in the Carson River. Um, there was a short duration of time in which an introduction must have occurred given the ca Caucasian settlement of the Carson Valley at that time. So, to sum that up visually in a timeline, there's a relatively short period of time where turtles are first described from three states, Washington, California, and Nevada, all in the mid 1800s. And recall, Genoa is founded by Mormons heading to California, not from California in that time frame. And then turtle trade and introductions begin to appear in newspaper articles toward the latter part of the 1800s. And then 20th century speculation of the species being introduced follows decades later. So the major point, Western palm turtles were noted shortly after Nevada's first settlement in the Carson Valley. And based on the timing of published literature, this appears to be knowledge gleaned before settlement. Additionally, you know, Carson Valley did receive repeated shipments of unknown terrapin species following white settlement. But for now, we're gonna move on to what's happened in the past 50 years. 
1970, Bruce Berry synthesized and added on to some work that Bradstrom and Stern published in 1959 regarding fossil records of pond turtles. So these maps are modified from those studies and they illustrate how the Western pond turtle distribution changed through time in Western North America. So during the Eocene, it's been understood that the precursor to the Western pond turtle might have raged, ranged, maybe raged, across the Intermountain West. And during the Pliocene, we see two species emerge in the Great Basin, which included an extinct pond turtle and what we consider to be the Western pond turtle. And they concluded that the Western pond turtle contracted its range from what you see here in the Great Basin Desert toward the Pacific Northwest and along the coast of California from the Pliocene to the Pleistocene. And that was due to climatic uh, warming and drying. And then 12 years later in 1982, Eugene Hattori, who was the curator of archeology span at the Nevada State Museum, was excavating a site on the dry lake bed of Winnemucca Lake, which historically was connected to the Truckee River. And there, Hattori found 27 Western pond turtle shell fragments, representing at least eight individuals. And cave deposits there dated back nearly 4.5 thousand years ago, although they could have been traded as abalone shells were also uncovered. But it does mark the earliest record of Western pond turtles in Nevada during the Holocene. Interestingly, a site at Pyramid Lake had a carapace splinter, which Hattori notes is likely pond turtle. And a third site near Fallon had another shell fragment. So that made for three archeological sites in the two river drainages, the Carson and the Truckee rivers that had pond turtle remains present. And going back to the Winnemucca Lake site, nearly 4,000 years ago, the lake retained water and it was connected to the Truckee River, Pyramid Lake and ancient Lake Lahontan. So turtles, might have had a nice time in that kind of habitat. So adding to our story map, we see turtles occurred in the Great Basin from the Pliocene and remain there into the Holocene as denoted by those red stars. And now we're gonna roll into the 21st century in genetics. So in 2005, Spinks and Schaefer looked at Western pond turtle mitochondrial and nuclear DNA to better understand variation and isolation across the turtles range. And what they found is interesting. Using six samples that were collected by Dan Holland in the late 1980s, they found five of those had haplotypes that were unique to the east side of the Sierra Nevada. They did not occur anywhere in, Cal in, in California. So going back to that timeline, while this might fit our new world understanding of Western pond turtles and their seemingly convoluted history in Nevada, I would argue that this scale is probably more appropriate as our evidence-based sleuthing suggests, turtles have occurred in Nevada since the Pliocene, through the Pleistocene, and into the current Holocene. And evidence does support that populations might have been augmented or even reintroduced in the past. The big question we hope we can answer soon is are the present populations native or relictual? Are they post-Pleistocene immigrants, like Bruce Berry's Northwest Passage hypothesis suggests? Are they potentially reintroduced during the modern Holocene, either tribal or Euro? Or are they a mix of some of those? Hopefully, we'll be able to answer those questions with genetic samples that we've been banking over the last several years. But I won't spoil anything yet, so stay tuned for the next talk for more on that. And a huge thank you to all the folks who helped with all the sleuthing and data collection for this uh, literature review. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. There are not any questions yet. And so we'll hang on just a minute and then you can move on into the next one. All right, Mark, I think you can move on to your next presentation. All right.
Oops. All right, well, I'm still Mark Enders, Nevada Department of Wildlife, and now I'll be giving my own talk. And so what I wanted to do here is present a very general overview of the work that Jason and I have been doing in Nevada to try to learn more about the Western palm turtles that we have here. I think in a lot of ways, the environment that we have here is, is very different from other parts of the species range. And so to start off with, uh, this map was in the last presentation, but you know, the major takeaways from the range of the Western pond turtle is that it's primarily a West Coast species with these isolated populations that do occur east of the major mountain ranges or inland. And that includes right here in, in Western Nevada. And so to zoom in, to give you a better sense of the geography and hydrology of this corner of Nevada, we have three major river sheds that all originate in the Sierra Nevada and they flow from California into Nevada where they all terminate either in a terminal lake or eventually dry up on a, on a playa. And we've had records of pond turtles in Nevada going back as, as you just saw to the mid 1800s. And um, you know, more recently we have uh, Dan Holland in the late 80s catching turtles. We have uh, incidental observations from the early 2000s. And, and so we, we know turtles are here, but somehow they've more or less gone under the radar and, and nobody has really taken the time to study them or learn more about them, which I think was a little alarming given that the species is declining across much of its range and, and is currently under review for ESA listing. So there was no time like the present. And so we took the opportunity in 2016 to start to try to gain that baseline information on the species here. And we started on the Carson River. And specifically, we started at one site on the Carson River, but this site had uh, the most diverse uh, types of, of waterways that, that you could expect to find in a desert environment. It has um, perennial water, first of all, but uh, large rivers, large in a west, western desert sense, but uh, it has open ponds, a complex network of wetlands, and even a network of irrigation sloughs that were put in over 150 years ago. And so the amount of water movement and diverse habitat types that an aquatic species could experience here is, is really pretty tremendous. And so this is where we focused our efforts in the first year 2016. And I'll mention that pond turtles had been observed here in the past and um, both historical past and recent past. And so to jump forward to some really brief uh, results from that effort, not knowing how many individuals we were going to catch there, we ended up being pretty successful in a relatively short amount of time, uh, only about eight or nine days of trapping that first year, we ended up handling 118 unique individuals they were all marked. You know, we came away with some interesting demographic information. You know, the skewed sex ratio is pretty obvious, 4.2 to one males to females. Although the literature would suggest that you should uh, not necessarily infer too much from that because we could have been trapping when females were laying eggs on land. But uh, colder temperatures also result in more males in a population. And I would say that, you know, here in the cold desert of Nevada, about 4,500 feet elevation, where probably among the coldest sites where the species occurs. So hard to really say if that's affecting that ratio, but we documented reproduction. We had 35% of our females gravid in the month of June. We don't really know their phenology here. Uh, you know, like I said, based on weather and, and um, our latitude, it, you know, we really weren't sure when females were gonna be reproductive, but we still had 35% carrying eggs at that time in the month of June. And we also ended up with some recaptures. So they weren't all terribly trap shy. And then we plotted all of those captures onto this histogram, basically to get a sense of what the population uh, demographics look like using size as a proxy for age, which seems to work well in some cases. And so mass on the x-axis there kind of shows us that it kind of wants to be a bell-shaped curve, but it's a little skewed towards older turtles. Uh, there's a talk later 
this morning that discusses how long the species can live. But I think, you know, one takeaway for us from a figure like this is that we do have turtles persisting in this location for a seemingly long period of time, which, you know, I feel like must be a positive, um, a positive thing that they're able to persist despite the challenges that occur there. You know, we are capturing fewer juveniles and, you know, there are non-native predators, potentially warm water fish that shouldn't occur in that river. Uh, we do have lots of bullfrogs and, um, you know, crayfish competitors potentially, but, um, you know, it's hard to really say exactly what's going on there. You know, we didn't catch any of the smallest size class here, but again, those turtles are so small, they're, they're not really known to go into traps very well. And so but we, were, we were able to capture um, uh, or at least document small turtles on the landscape. That's not one of those 260 pound turtles next to it. That's a regular size Western pond turtle. And so the one inside that red circle is, is a hatchling that's um, you know, really quite small hanging out with his big friends. And the amount of time we spent out on the landscape that first summer, we were also able to document hatchlings in, in other ways, just from observations and getting lucky. And that first year, we spent a lot of time out on that landscape because we actually affixed VHF transmitters to 15 individuals. And then using a great deal of volunteer help, we were able to track those turtles for the duration of the summer, about four months, which was difficult and, and I think came with its challenges. But you know, we did come away with some interesting information. I would say for the sake of this talk, you know, the one thing that stood out the most was just how far these turtles are moving in this one particular aquatic system that we studied in 2016. Males had a linear home range of over two kilometers. Even uh, females and even juveniles had linear home ranges occupying over a kilometer of, of, of linear waterway. And so, you know, really what that represents to us as a wildlife management agency is just how complicated conservation might be in a situation like that where you have a species that is occupying a waterway, which in the West, you know, there's a lot of hands trying to, to get a piece of that pie. But, um, you know, you have multiple private ownerships and jurisdictions that, that are being crossed by these individuals. So, you know, it's something that we're going to try to strive uh, towards collaboration and cooperation as we look towards conservation of pond turtles here. And so in 2017, the next year, we decided to go big and we went into all three of these river sheds in western Nevada. So on the Carson River we expanded to five additional sites um, and just to jump to the the chase here we were unsuccessful trapping turtles at any of the locations except for the original 2016 location where we ended up in a very short amount of time just a few days capturing 40 turtles including some recaptures from 2016 the previous year and so at that point, you know, we really start to wonder why aren't we catching turtles at those other locations where in most cases, turtles had occurred in the past. We had documentation of them in those other locations, but we weren't catching them in 2017. And, and the first thing that came to mind, honestly, was the amount of flooding that we had that year. The winter of 2016-17 was the largest winter we've ever experienced in Western Nevada and the Lake Tahoe area. And so there was tremendous winter flooding. And this is a photo in June, at which point the rivers should already be receding, but this isn't even the river. It's just the floodplain, still under a foot of water. <clears throat> and so, you know, one thing that makes me, um, I guess, assume pond turtles are able to occupy an area like this despite catastrophic flooding is that the floodplain is functioning. All that energy can dissipate into the floodplain and the wetlands. And so I think that, uh, you know, that's one reason potentially pond turtles were captured here and other places, maybe the floodplain wasn't functioning well enough for them to withstand that catastrophic flooding. Or rewind the clock back to September of 2014 and here's a photo of, of the Carson River bone dry. And so that's one of the challenges here in a desert environment is that, you know, in the middle of a three year drought like this picture uh, there may not be any water available for an aquatic species, which I think has obvious challenges. We also went to the Walker River, trapped one site where Dan Holland had 
captured a Western pond turtle in the late 80s, um, although he was skeptical about whether it had been planted there. And we didn't find any turtles there at the Walker River. And then on the Truckee River, where we do have evidence and, and records of pond turtles occurring here, uh, we trapped three sites and had success at only one. And again, we had higher expectations. We only caught two turtles on the Truckee River, and you saw the numbers on the Carson River, so there's a, a clear disparity there. But again, you know, my first thought comes back to the flooding that we had that winter. This is December, and this may look like a trickle to some folks uh, in the east, but in reality, this, this river, the Truckee right now in this photo is several feet over flood stage and the worst flooding was actually in January and February. So surely there was mortality and displacement and other things that were affecting aquatic species during these events. So not to be deterred, we persevered 2018 and 19. We skipped the Walker River, but we went back to the Carson and Truckee because really we were trying to get a better sense of distribution and also you know, collect those genetic samples. And so we went back into those sites on the Carson and, and in 2018 and 19 combined had much better success trapping turtles. And we ended up catching pond turtles in places where Dan Holland caught them 30 plus years ago. And we still have turtles persisting and, and thriving. You know, we had uh, juveniles on the landscape, very large sized turtles, males, females, it seemed to be, you know, a very functioning population just uh, from our capture data. Got back into those three sites on the Truckee and again had slightly better success, although I'll say that, you know, success was still a lot lower on the Truckee River. And I think the Truckee has unique challenges relative to these other Western Nevada rivers, primarily the fact that it flows through the urban area of Reno and Sparks. You know, settlement uh, occurred, you know, 200 years ago here and, and the river was straightened and channelized. There's concrete and riprap and other development issues that have taken away the floodplain, the riparian uh, streamside vegetation. And, uh, you know, so I, I think the Truckee River presents um, some unique challenges to pond turtles in Nevada, but they are persisting here in seemingly low numbers. And so, you know, at this point, we take a step back. And in 2020, we had really big plans, just like the rest of the world. And so those got pushed back to 2021, which I heard is going to be a great year. And, you know, one of the things we're going to accomplish in these three watersheds is eDNA surveys. Try to use a novel technique that's going to help us get a better sense of distribution of western pond turtles in these watersheds that's going to help supplement the trapping data that we have. Additionally, we've been collecting genetic samples and uh, been talking with Brad Schaefer's lab at UCLA about integrating those into a range-wide rad sequencing study that is really going to answer some very important questions that we've touched on here today. First of all, are they native? Is there any connectivity currently, which seems impossible? Is there connectivity among the rivers in Nevada where these populations occur? And so I think that's going to really be, um, you know, a great deal of information that we're going to learn from that effort. And additionally, we're going to deploy about 20 GPS transmitters to try to get it at more fine scale information like nesting sites, hibernation, even winter activity. Some of the things that we really couldn't get at with that VHF uh, volunteer effort back in 2016. So big things to come for us in 2021. Uh, I'd like to thank a lot of different people. The Nature Conservancy is our primary partner on this project. Uh, none of this could really happen without their help. Uh, Christina Jones, Arizona Game and Fish, loaned us hoop, hoop nets for the first couple of years, taught us everything we know about catching turtles, and um, the American Turtle Observatory funded that telemetry effort, and, and just a host of volunteers and endowed colleagues that have helped over the last several years, and so thanks to all of them, and if there are any questions, I see at least three, um, so I guess I'll just get going on that. Does that sound good? Absolutely. Just read them back to us. <clears throat> have you looked, analyzed, have you looked at, analyzed your capture recapture data to generate abundance in size sex specific capture probability estimates? So no, in, I think the issue that we really face is the amount of personnel that we have is limited. So really it's just me and Jason and whoever we can convince or, or bribe to come help us. Although 
uh, we've had lots of great volunteers. Um, you know, really, we, we sort of are limited in the scale of what we can accomplish each year. So initially, we were marking turtles, we batch marked them, took high res photos, because, you know, the plastron is really just a fingerprint. And so, you know, the plan is to do this long term type of population um, tracking and estimate of abundance and, and um, and again, like capture probability estimates, I think all that's super interesting. But in the third year of our study, we were getting kind of desperate to get genetic samples from other reaches of these rivers. And so retrapping the River Fork Ranch wasn't in the cards. Um, and, you know, we, we didn't have any recaptures like downstream, you know, we have samples stretching across 30 plus miles of, of the Carson River, for example, uh, we weren't getting recaptures across distances like that. And so we're not to that point yet, but uh, I think that is, you know, the long-term goal of this effort is, is to have it, you know, be able to answer some of those questions. Is the Truckee River colder on average than the others? So I think that's a good, a good question. And I don't have any data to back it up, but my, my feeling is that it probably is. And it tends to act a little more like a mountain stream than the others by the time it gets into Nevada. So the Carson River, the Walker River, they, they're slower, lazier rivers by the time they get into Nevada, the water's slower, there's more sediment in the, in the riverbed, whereas the Truckee kind of remains cobbly through the urban corridor of Reno. And it's not till you get past that where that energy kind of dissipates and you have a lower gradient that allows uh, you know, sediment to accumulate. And so that doesn't really get at temperature, but I feel like just based on how fast that water is moving um, and, and you know, it's not as deep, I feel like you know, there's a chance that, that that water just stays a little bit colder. Um, it just has more of that feel to it of a mountain stream based on how it acts. Do these watersheds have consistent morphology? Uh, large inguinal scales, uh, question for both. Um, you know, I would, so if you're talking about the, the watersheds having consistent morphology, like, um, so gradient and, and that type of thing and, and depth and, and banks, is that what you mean? Um, if that's the case, then, then like I said, there's, there's variation among, among the rivers and even within a river, like I mentioned the Truckee, um, the turtles themselves seem to have uh, consistent morphology. Um, and so I think, you know, we're not seeing really noticeable differences um, in their appearance or anything like that. What are the water temperatures where you're catching them? Again, uh, cold. It's all, you know, Sierra Nevada snowmelt fed for the most part. The Truckee River actually originates in Lake Tahoe. And so, um, you know, the, the water temperatures, I, I think, colder than, than what you would find in, in let's say, most east, eastern rivers and streams, uh, just based on the fact that snowmelt is, is the origin. So that tends to be more pronounced in the spring when there's actually snowmelt occurring. Um, but even this time of year, you know, you'd get a little chilly taking a dip in it as a, as a person. Question number five, we live in California and we absolutely love turtles. How can we volunteer? I will maybe scroll back to my email address which is at the bottom of the screen there. And you can contact me directly. And I'd be happy to chat about pond turtles in Nevada and how you might be able to participate. And we only have time for five questions. Thank you. I had a, a good morning here giving two talks in a row and I appreciate your time and uh, enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you so much. Just need to wait. Just give it a second. Just, just wait a second. Mm, I don't know why it's not showing me. No. <laughs> Just as a quick check, can you hear us? Absolutely. Okay. All right. So. No, I can't see anybody. Second here. Well, 
They don't have to see me. They can see you. You just can't see them. <laughs> so I just see the so, questions. So. One second. Well, well, if you can hear me, I'll kind of start off here. I enjoyed those talks on Nevada up there on the high plateau. And I uh, did a little bit of work, not too much, just to the west of there up on the Modoc Plateau and the Klamath Lakes, which is kind of amazing. Also overlooked for a long time. We didn't know turtles could even survive. Klamath Lake area is 4,000 feet elevation and it gets cold. It freezes. It's a totally different kind of habitat. So I really enjoyed seeing those in Nevada. Thank you very much for that. And I so just click. So now we're going to switch from kind of deserts to the northern area and out here, the western pond turtle, you go any farther west and you're in the ocean. So we're on the western periphery. And today I'm going to talk about western pond turtles uh, reproduction. Uh, we'll focus on clutch sizes. Is there any double clutching? Not known that far north yet in their nesting season. Uh, there are several co-authors, Frank and Kate Slavens, and my daughter Gwen, who's doing technical things. But here's a general view of the area since Southern Washington. You'll notice there's a few, it's kind of open on the lowlands. Uh, there's some oak trees, some, some dug fir mixed in there here and there. But it is kind of a little, pocket of Mediterranean climate up in Washington and there's a few other spots like this around. And that's where the turtle lives because the turtle still is a reptile and it, and it does require higher temperatures than things like salamanders. So you're not gonna, you're gonna find them in, mostly in the oak woodland habitat up here in the northern part of the range. But to really point this out, I'd especially like to thank Frank and Kate Slavens uh, they were earlier at the Woodland Park Zoo in Seattle, and they've been affiliated with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. They're both now retired, and they've thrown themselves into this uh, collection of data. And, and this data set is really theirs. I'm here to help just analyze it and also go in and move it along. So you're awesome. Thank you very much for your dedication. Uh, the Western pond turtle, there is some doubt if it's up in BC, there's a separate topic, but it basically has this linear range, which is actually quite long, so over a thousand miles north to south. Uh, in parts of the range, like Southern Oregon and parts of Northern California, to me, they're still doing relatively well, but the Northern part and the Southern areas, the turtles appear to be declining. Another reason to study them, as today points out, uh, turtles are charismatic. Uh, they're also very high concern to state and federal agencies, a lot of conservation groups, and the public loves them, so we won't turn that down. As I mentioned, some populations are declining, but not all of them, and they are protected in all states of Mexico, at least you do need permits. And it was earlier proposed in 1991 and it was not listed, but it does now back up again for listing. So earlier, as mentioned, Dan Holland did a report, this is not published, but he did this major phone book size report, like 200 pages for the Bonneville Power Administration. <clears throat> and in there for the Northwest, he reported that the majority of females probably oviposit in alternate years, that is every other year. In Oregon, he also pointed out the average clutch size was about seven. And range-wise, the clutch size is positively correlated with, with care pace length. That is, if you have a large, real large female, she'll have more eggs than a small one. So there is minimal information on reproduction in turtles up in this area. Uh, as far as I know, published information. We have zero data on uh, clutch size in Washington and minimal in Oregon. So objectives for this study, you know, what is the mean clutch size and does it vary? Do females deposit eggs annually or as Dan suggested, maybe less so? 
Is there any double clutching, which has been found in some Southern populations? When is the peak nesting? And what are the implications for conservation and management? So this is some pictures of their habitat, kind of shallow lakes, uh, lots of aquatic vegetation, which is excellent habitat for the juveniles, basking structures, and as you notice in the background, open areas, which are the preferred <coughs> nesting areas. Now, this study was an intensive tracking using radio transmitters. So in the evening, the turtle, the females come out, move out and up once to nest. So they followed individuals. And this was done over 15 years. There were uh, an incredible amount of work. And they found if you were, used some stealth and watched it, they found they could follow the turtles without disturbing them, which in itself is uh, also miraculous, but they did track them. The females were fine if you stayed back a bit. <coughs> so up there in the left side, uh, there's the turtles are brown and they live in brown dirt, brown on brown. So they're, they're kind of hard to see, but they are turtles and they're fairly large, but they only come out for a little while to nest. But once on the right, the the turtles, once the once they make the nest, they do cover it up and the nests are for us and you know very hard to find. So you do need to, in this case, new radio telemetry. Yeah. Um, the pattern. Uh, it's like many turtles, the peak is in June, but also we found out that there's a secondary peak like uh, in early July. So this is something to keep in mind. We kind of expect that and this turtle is somewhat unique in that they, they, the, the eggs and hatchlings often will overwinter. They don't hatch out in late summer, but that's also another, topic that I won't get into too much today. <laughs> so the number of nests, and which is just incredible, the Slavens work, uh, I said we've gone from zero in our knowledge base and they, they have found 245 nests. There's a mean of about 6.2, but most of the females had from four to eight eggs per clutch. Now, just quickly to compare that down in California and all of the work in California is by Dave Germano and co-authors. Uh, the mean clutch size down on, on the coast of California is like 5.5, Washington 6.2, and then the interior in the Central Valley, uh, Germano found clutch mean clutch is seven, and then down in Fresno, it's about 8.5. <laughs> and Dave and others have found double clutching in about 5% of the population. And miraculously, he found a couple that had uh, three clutches per year down there in California. So Washington, this is the first time we have, uh, we have had uh, double clutching recorded. It's rare, but it does occur. And this has, uh, well, here's some other implications for it. There were only 11 individuals that double clutch but the number of eggs in total for those individuals was 93 in the first clutch, 72 in the second. And the means here in red, 6.6 .6 versus 5.1, there's like one less egg in the second clutch. So maybe this is just not enough resources, but, but again, that is a major contribution if you have two of them. And the interval in between them is like 27 days. Uh, so it did take them a little while, almost a month to get a second clutch ready. So this does have something to think about. I'm asked a couple of experts for still thinking of this. I haven't seen it published, but maybe it's out there. It's just me, I haven't got all the literature. But if you go out and look at these animals, they tracked them over 15 years, just for example, in red, this one up on top here. Uh, first time they found her, she had seven eggs. The next year she had 11, then back down to seven and up to eight. And then later 
there's a little break in here. Uh, there were fewer eggs. But the point is, is the females do not lay the same number of eggs each year. You expect this, this is biology, you expect some variation. But you know why, why it does change from year to year, uh, we don't have a reason for that at the moment. We are trying to look at some, <laughs> some differences in temperature. Uh, just a second here. Oh, smoke's getting to me. Uh, so I, that's fine, we, but we do have this kind of variation that people have in their data sets, but I think it would be nice to kind of track these. Uh, this telemetry study has revealed this pattern that I don't think has really been out there in the literature. But if we added in those second clutches, and there's just two cases. So you have that female in red, you add in her second clutch, she, she went from like nine eggs at or less, yeah, in, in a year. But if you add the second clutch, it bumps up to 15. So that really changes the reproductive output for that individual for that year. So double clutching is rare, but when it happens, it adds appreciably to the output. So, uh, we're doing a time, but um, kind of going faster, maybe too fast. But some internal conclusions: uh, the peak nesting is in mid June, and second peaks in early July. So this helps to know, like you know, if you're going to focus your time of your crew or whatnot, we now know, you know, when when's the best time to be out there, and that's new information. Clutch size is around six. A little, yeah, it's kind of within the range of the other populations, but a little smaller. There's annual lake deposition in the females that were tracked. Uh, that's kind of that's new. There's about four to five percent of them double clutch, and the second clutch was like one egg less. And as I showed in those histograms, the clutch size of individual turtles vary annually, but it's usually around you know two to three of the kind of the average. So kind of step back a little bit for conservation and management. You know, I think this telemetry especially helps us to locate nesting areas. <clears throat> and then I think it's important to safeguard some of these nests. I think some people get, we get too carried away. We don't need to protect them all. I mean, predation is part of nature too, but if you want to increase your population numbers, you might find where most of the females are nesting and maybe protect part of that. And it doesn't have to be every year either. I mean, these turtles, as you'll find out in a minute, do live for a while. Uh, also the telemetry can, can track down where the, what are the call them the best soils thermal regimes and best by the I should define that that's really that's where you have the highest success rate for hatching uh, and also for turtles we have to think on a scale few of us can imagine but they uh, are around quite a while and we need to protect those females for long periods of time mm -hmm. So jumping around here, I'd like to thank, there's a lot of volunteers and field helpers. I won't name them all here, but very generous contributions here from the Woodland Park Zoo and the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and lots of other help around. And I may have talked too fast, which is unknown for me, but I wonder if there's any questions. So, <laughs> got one question there in the chat. Yeah. So one question, how certain is the second nesting period? It looked like the histogram only bumped up by one clutch in early July. Is that just sampling variation? Well, no, this, there is that secondary bump also in the Oregon populations. I didn't show everything here, but, the, the, but it's not very many, but there does seem to be uh, the turtles with, with you know, a, a secondary period of nesting. 
the next question, have gravid females been x-rayed to see oviduct involvement? Mm. I can't answer that one. I'd have to ask the sleeve it's about that. But we, we x-ray turtles in Oregon. In this situation, which is kind of unique, they, they track the nest. And when they find a nest, they, they, they wait for the female to finish. And then they flag it and they put mesh over it. And then later, those nests are dug up. And those, many of those go into head starting programs and other things. So they keep track of them. Here in Oregon, we, we don't radio track them. We x-ray the females to get clutch sized, but I didn't talk about that today. And, we have one more on the way. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me for blowing my nose so much, but we got smoke here like you won't believe we have. We're in Corvallis, Oregon, and it's bad. Yesterday we had 495 out of 500, for, and the hazard starts at 300. So we're, you know, we're smoked in, and our air is a little chewy today. And we have ash coming down, actually falling out from the forest fires. And me, I got <laughs> allergies. So sorry about the hacking here. Any more questions? What's coming what? in? Did they find? that they nest every other year on average? No. No, the records actually indicated the females track nested every year and there were enough records in a row where they look like they nest. I mean, some individuals, they don't catch them every year. I mean, you get a couple of turtles moving out there in the woods, they're hard to track. But no, they, they appear to nest every year. Uh, you know, there might be an exception here or there, but pretty much annual annual reproduction. Is that it or that was the last go longer? One. Thank you, Grace. Oh good. That's fine by me. I gotta go blow my nose. So we have another famous speaker coming up. So <laughs> if that's okay with you, I'm gonna change things up. Thanks. All right, they can still hear you. Okay, hello, give me one second to switch over talks. While we wait for Gwen, I'd like to remind everyone to go to our website and check out poster session number two. It went up last week and there's a lot of great stuff in there. Thank you, everyone. I watch it from here. Not right now. Not right now. Um, so, hello, everyone. I'm just uh, switching over to our other talk for today. So, uh, Thank you very much to Bruce, who's now sitting next to me um, for the talk on reproduction. Um, I'm sure none of you, of course, would ever insult a turtle, but there are certainly people who have um, doubts about some things. And I'm here to talk about one of the things uh, or not. I'm having a minor technical difficulty. Give me one moment, please. We had this issue earlier and uh, I was convinced we had solved it. Uh, as you know, um, life is always exciting. Okay. So uh, we're going to do this in presenter mode. Hopefully, uh, these are large enough that you can all see the slides. I'm going to go with this. Uh, so um, I am going to talk today about the repercussions of longevity in the Western pond turtle. Um, so what, how long do they live and why does that matter? One of the reasons that we determine longevity is because a lot of the life history models depend on longevity to uh, function. 
And also turtles are in general an icon of longevity. So though longevity does vary among taxa, understanding that variation is very important to biology in general and especially to turtle biology. In addition, sometimes individuals appear to be old, but we don't know what that means for their uh, biology and ecology. So for us, for this particular study, our objection, our objectives woo, were to see what the longevity of Western pond turtles in the wild was, what the rate of decrease in recapture over time was, uh, were those old large turtles still reproducing, and what ramifications for this do we have then in management for the species. So Western pond turtles, in case you missed some of the earlier talks, um, are a medium-sized endemic turtle. They live in streams and rivers and ponds. They're this lovely mud brown color that matches very closely with their background. They only feed aquatically, but they can spend a lot of time on land, um, sometimes more of the year than they spend in the water. As far as their range, uh, they live on the west coast of the United States, Washington, Oregon, and California. And this is a very Mediterranean climate with hot, dry summers. We often have no precipitation in the summer at all and then very cool and wet winters. So we are still, hopefully, continuing this long-term study of Western pond turtles that began in 1968. And this was a very intensive study for the first several years. And then since then, we've gone back more intermittently. So we revisited the site approximately every 10 years, sometimes more frequently than that, and sometimes less frequently than that. And our site is in Northern California and it is a stream system, not a pond system. I realize they're a pond turtle, but they live in both. So for our methods, again, this is over uh, many decades. So there's been some variety in methods, mainly the turtles have been captured by hand, um, by snorkeling and diving, uh, but we also have trapped many turtles at this site. Once we have the turtles in hand, we measure their shell, we take mass. Um, each individual is marked by filing notches into the scutes. The annular rings on the scutes are counted. I realize that some people don't have good success with this in other species, but in Western pond turtles, it works very well. And we have citations for that if you need them. Um, and then the females are palpated. And if we can feel eggs, uh, then they're x-rayed. So, this is a little bit of the results from the original study. So the original study was from 1968 to 1974. And almost all of the turtles caught at that time are adults, were adults at the time they were captured. So one of the things about aging turtles via annuli is that as they get older, especially in these rocky systems, such as this system, um, the annuli actually wear off of the shell and you can no longer reliably age that turtle. So looking at this graph, we have the number of turtles and the age. However, above a certain age, we are unable to determine how old they are and therefore they are simply binned as adults. And so you can see here that while uh, we did catch some smaller animals, mostly the animals caught were adults. At the 2008 revisit, uh, we managed to recapture adult female marked code number 83. So this was 40 years between the initial capture and this capture. And because this individual was estimated to be 20 years old when marked, this is a turtle that is at least 60 years old. Uh, this turtle was found in the exact same pool where they were initially captured, and this is not a particularly large pool, and was in excellent condition with no appearance of aging. When we revisited in 2018, we managed to recapture adult female code number 50. So this animal was marked when they were five years old, and so was recaptured uh, 50 years later for a total age of 55 years. And again, this animal was in superb health. Here you can see Bruce holding uh, number 50 here and a first year hatchling 
uh, for comparison. Now, not all of the turtles that we're catching here are very old turtles. There's certainly a smaller amount of the population as the years go on. So of our 174 recaptures that we've had in the revisits from 2008 to 2018, um, of those, only 10 of them are, are very old turtles. However, some of those, right, we showed you the one that's uh, 50. Uh, we have a whole bunch that are in the 40s as well. They are not a huge part of the population, um, but turtles that it has been uh, more than 20 years since we initially captured and marked the animal are about 5% of the population that we are currently, or in the past few years, recapturing. Um, and so this is a decline over time. So of the percent of the turtles that we, kept, that we recapture, the years since first marking declines. Um, but notice, right, that we're out here in the 50 year range. And so that's still uh, pretty exciting that we're capturing this many really old turtles. Just recapturing old turtles weren't all of our goals. So uh, we also were looking to see whether these old turtles were still reproducing. And this is uh, that adult female code number 50. So we know how old this turtle is, 55 years old at this uh, data point and she had nine eggs. So Bruce talked about how larger Western pond turtles uh, are able to have more eggs per clutch. And so this means that these adult females are producing eggs over decades. And we estimate based on the average number of eggs that this means that this single individual could have produced more than 300 eggs over her lifetime. So our evidence suggests, right, that some Western pond turtles are living a very long time, 50 plus years, 60 plus years. Most adult turtles are likely reproductive for many decades, um, though of course these are the ones that have avoided major mortality events such as roadkill and predators. These old adults add appreciably to this population's viability and that this has major ramifications for future and current management of this species. We have a few more uh, important quotes for you. High longevity also helps turtles compensate for their highly variable annual reproductive success, which depends largely on environmental conditions. Nests are often destroyed and hatchlings can have high mortality rates. Extended longevity allows turtles to produce successive clutches for a long lifetime. There are, of course, still many questions. Um, how many, we don't know how many of the original 850 turtles that were marked in the initial study are still alive. And we also don't know whether they're still in the study area. Uh, we primarily have studied just the original reach and we don't know how many of the turtles have moved out of that reach. So our estimations of how many alive are also tangled up with how many are present in the area. There are also questions about whether this large population will be able to persist, persist in the future. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, our study has been on hold for two years because this site is on private land and the landowner has opted not to give us access to it. Speaking of the site, this was a fairly remote ranch uh, at the beginning of this study but it is currently in the center of a boom in legal cannabis farming. This is not the actual site, this is just upstream up there, but you can see around it the many different uh, cannabis farms. And these are not only taking large amounts of water out of the creek every year for irrigation, but also have significant amounts of runoff of many different kinds into the creek. Now, Waterways are disjunct and rare in this habitat. We're gonna to have to do something slightly exciting here. Um, for example, at this site, the nearest other viable waterway where Western pond turtles could live 
is up to 20 kilometers in one direction and eight kilometers in the other. So this is certainly not a habitat where there are a lot of different places that they can go. Because of this longevity, water planning is going to have to take place over multiple human generations and uh, certainly over many turtle generations. And we are seeing an increase in the area of development, as I've talked about, of droughts and fires, which interact with one another, um, which as Bruce always mentioned, uh, it's a little bit smoky here today. Uh, this is a satellite image taken from the past 24 hours. This is essentially the range of the Western pond turtle right here, and it is completely socked in with smoke. Um, it is not daylight outside here right now. And a lot of this area is currently on fire. So this is definitely having an impact on the species. Of course, we need to thank all of the people who have made uh, decades of work possible. A lot of them have been volunteers or taking time off of their day jobs. Um, they work for many different agencies and universities and have been out on their weekends helping us catch turtles. I also, of course, need to thank my all-star team of co-authors, uh, my father, Bruce Burry, Don Ashton, who you'll hear from in a little while, Jamie Batazzo, Dave Germano, um, and uh, Thomas, Don's son, for putting up with us boring adults in the field for most of his lifetime. We are, of course, very uh, serious about turtle conservation and safety. And with that, I will take any questions that you might have. I like that our turtle is wearing a mask. Uh, I'm hang on just a minute to see if we have anything come over from you too. I am not worried. <laughs> They're all thinking about you guys out there with all the wildfires. It is, it is dramatic. I have lived in and next to a lot of fire in my lifetime. And I will say that this yeah. is some of the worst smoke I have ever experienced um, and constant fires popping up around us. It's very exciting. Let's just take a look. It's a generational thing too, you might say Germanos. I mean, you. Yes, this is uh, doing a doing a study over 50 years means that uh, my talking about we collected this data means my father collected this data and uh, we now are also involving um, Thomas as a uh, second generation turtle biologist. Here comes a question. Can you see it? Or do you need me to read? Wildfire impact turtles directly, such as burns, or impact indirectly, such as water quality changes, et cetera. Um, all of the above, uh, it's not a super well studied thing. It also really depends on the time of year that things burn. So, um, for example, like winter controlled burns are going to have a very different effect than a peak of summer burn. Um, it depends on how. Uh, at what phase the, the turtles are, if they are estivating, like down in the mud in the bottom of a big pond, the fire might burn over the top and they might see no impact at all. Um, uh, that is a, a extremely variable thing. Uh, fire, of course, has tons of impacts at an ecological level and may have direct impacts if you get a catastrophic fire that goes through especially a small site or goes through at a time of year when the turtles are very active, especially if they're um, up in the forest. But honestly, we don't really know the direct impact. Um, I don't know of any studies directly on that. Um, if anyone would knows of a funding source for that, we have all sorts of sites. But um, do we expect to regain access to the site? Mm. Maybe. We are hopeful. Um, we have continued to be in negotiations over the past two years, uh, but we have not yet reached a, a successful conclusion with the site owner as to regaining access. Um, do you know the longest Western pond turtle life record for captive pets? No. 
<laughs> short answer, no. Um, this isn't a species that is kept a lot in the pet industry, which we're very happy about. Um, I, and I mean, they're very long. Most, many turtles are very long lived. Western pond turtles are certainly long lived. I don't know of a captive record. Don't know. We don't keep them. Yeah, <laughs> we don't keep them. Um, and Anymore. even if uh, we had, that would be over my lifetime. So, <laughs> all right, I will send it on to the next person. Have a good day, everybody. That's it for now. Just wait. Okay. Um, just give me a moment here and I'll switch over to my slides. Okay, so hi, my name is Melissa Riley and I'm a graduate student in Brian Todd's lab at the University of California, Davis. I'm also an environmental scientist for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of the Western Pond Turtle projects we've been working on in the marshes of Northern California. So to orient you to my talk, first I'm gonna give you some background about our study system and plans for tidal restoration there why it's important that we study Western pond turtles in this unique habitat. And then I'll tell you a little bit about of our current knowledge as well as our study objectives, some of our results so far and the analyses we plan to do in the future. So the San Francisco Bay Estuary once provided habitat for a number of unique and important fish and wildlife species. However, since the 1800s, the estuary has been highly modified and over 90% of the tidal wetlands have been lost most of the land has either been developed or diked for other purposes like agriculture and waterfowl hunting. Despite the loss of tidal marsh habitat, this region remains important for many endemic species. So today, as I talk about managed wetlands, I will mostly be referring to those that are used um, for waterfowl habitat. Managed wetlands within the estuary are considered an important stopover for waterfowl on the Pacific Flyway. However, it's been assumed that these diked managed wetlands offer little habitat value to other species. Through recent studies, we've shown that diked managed wetlands provide important habitat, not just for waterfowl, but for a plethora of other species. Oftentimes, these managed and tidal wetlands can act very similar in terms of providing habitat. So for example, here, the managed wetland on the left and the tidal wetland on the right look fairly similar in terms of vegetation cover and height. But the difference here is that the tidal wetlands experience variations in water levels through daily inundation, and the managed wetlands are generally flooded seasonally from fall to late January in order to provide that habitat for waterfowl. This is an example of some of the other species that benefit from our dike to managed wetlands. This includes fish and wildlife like the Northern Harrier, the Thule elk, the Sacramento split tail, the endangered salt marsh harvest mouse, and the focus of today's talk, the Western Pond Turtle. While we've been showing that managed wetlands in their current state can support healthy populations of many species, these wetlands are facing a variety of changes in the near future. There are numerous plans calling for tens of thousands of acres of tidal restoration over the next 30 years. Many of these plans have realized the need to move away from focal species approaches into restoration projects that have multi-species benefits but this can still be challenging depending on the specific restoration priorities of a project proponents and funding sources that push for an emphasis on specific suites of species, for example, endangered fish. In some cases, it's not known how restoration will impact wildlife, but this gives us a good opportunity to answer key uncertainties as part of an adaptive management approach. So why study turtles in this context and in this habitat? Again, they can help us answer some key uncertainties in our various restoration plans, such as how species use the current managed wetlands and also help us to compare habitat values between tidal and managed wetlands. Turtles may also be good indicators of ecosystem health because they utilize both the aquatic and terrestrial habitats. However, this can also make them more susceptible to some of our upcoming changes. 
And then finally, by learning more about the turtles, we can help support multi-species management and conservation as tidal restoration projects are implemented. So we've already talked a little bit today about the range of the Western pond turtle all the way up from Oregon down to Baja, California. In California, there are only remaining freshwater turtle. Uh, since the mid 1990s in California, Western pond turtles have been listed as a species of special concern. And as some of our other speakers mentioned today, they are petitioned to be listed as endangered. In other parts of their range, like Oregon and Washington, they're already listed either as threatened or endangered, primarily due to causes like habitat loss in both the aquatic and terrestrial environments, disease and competition with non-native red eared sliders. So in my specific study area, Western pond turtles are thought to be widespread, but we really don't know a lot about them. No formal studies have been conducted and the historical observations are only incidental to other surveys. So the information about their population sizes and habitat use is very sparse. That's where we at UC Davis and the Department of Fish and Wildlife came in and we wanted to learn more about Western pond turtles in our habitat and especially before the implementation of these tidal restoration projects. So first we wanted to obtain baseline demographic information about how many turtles we have in different areas and the structure of these populations. Next, we wanna determine their habitat use to see which habitats are important during different parts of the year for activities like basking, nesting, and overwintering. And then finally, we wanted to see how land use changes like tidal restoration will affect these turtles going into the future. So a little bit about our methods. Um, since 2017, we've been conducting monthly live trapping at several sites using hoop net traps with floats attached. Um, trapping sessions are from March to September when the turtles are most active. And then each turtle gets uh, measured as well as individually marked by filing their marginal scoots. And then we've also deployed some camera traps and basking platforms like the one in the right hand corner of the slide. We're also taking pictures of each turtle on the carapace and plastron so we can track their growth. And then as Gwen mentioned, we can use these annuli also to try to get an age estimate of our turtles. So here's some of our trapping data so far. So this graph shows the number of captures we had starting in 2017. And we've trapped in several different habitat types. So our orange bar is showing a managed marsh. That's the one that is planned for tidal restoration. And then our blue and gray lines show captures in two different ditches that are used for water conveyance. And then um, our last habitat type that we've trapped in is a stock pond, and this was only trapped in 2019. So far, we've marked over 400 individual turtles in our study area. So this is a still photo from one of our camera traps that's used to monitor um, the basking platforms. There were basking platforms in two different locations. One was an actively managed site and the other that's shown here is a passively managed pond that's going to be restored. So the cameras took a photo every hour and then we could go back and count the number of individuals basking to determine their activity during the day and also across seasons. So this is a time lapse of one of the platforms. So you see they start out early in the morning and kind of peaks during midday and then tapers off into the evening before sunset. Um, this is some of that basking platform data synthesized. So it shows the two sites in red. We have our passively managed site where um, they were more active starting in April and May. And then both sites sort of peaked in June and tapered off into the fall as our turtles went to search for overwintering sites. So next we'll talk about uh, what we've been doing to look at habitat use and trying to determine the effects of uh, tidal restoration. So we've attached uh, GPS trackers, like the, they're like the transmitters that are put on to waterfall and they upload to cell phone towers to give us location information in real time. And then they also have a solar panel on the top to be used for um, charging the batteries. So here's one of our turtles going back into the water with this transmitter. 
We've deployed over 20 transmitters. We have nine females and eight males at our managed marsh that's planned for tidal restoration. And then we have three males and three females at a control site. So there he goes, made it in there. So the main area where we're focus focusing our tracking efforts is slated for tidal restoration within the next year. When the levees are breached, 650 acres of managed ponds will be returned to full tidal action. Currently at the site, there's a large complex of managed ponds with adjacent uplands, as well as an adjacent tidal area. And we wanna compare the behavior of our turtles before and after the restoration project so we can see how they're going to react as more project, projects are implemented in the future. So one of our first male turtles was trapped in uh, from 2019. He spent May and June in the northern part of one of the ponds. And then July and August, he moved further south in the pond about one kilometer away from his starting point. And then in late August, he actually moved into a tidal channel and went into a fully tidal area and stayed there through winter and into early spring. Um, probably found an overwintering site that was uh, dominated by salt grass. So to give you an idea of what this habitat looks like, um, this is one of our managed ditches and water can be controlled by the water managers, but it's usually in this area slow moving and circulating throughout much of the year. And there are some vegetated banks where we often see turtles basking. This is an example of one of the tidal sloughs. Again, we have these vegetated banks, but um, in this habitat, there's also exposed mud bank banks that become available to turtles during lower tides. So here we can see a couple of turtles hanging out in this tidal slough. So we have another male who did something a little bit different. He was tagged in March of 2018. Unfortunately, we only have a few months of data on him. Uh, but for spring, most of spring, he remained in our managed pond complex. And then in May, he took a trip into an urban creek. So this is an example of what the urban creek looked like. Um, so he was right up there close to the development in the area. And then the last turtle I'll talk about is one of our females and she was tagged in April of 2018. Uh, for most of the year, she remained in the managed ponds, but during May and June, she went north of the pond and into an upland area likely to nest. So this is what it looks like in those upland fields, and then also an example of one of our predated nests. So in summary, we are really finding turtles everywhere in our study system. They're using a variety of different habitats. We are seeing some seasonality to their movements and activity, which is varying by sex. Some turtles are moving a lot, uh, several kilometers, but others are staying close in their managed pond. And then knowledge about their movement can help us with future management and conservation. So with this data, what we eventually hope to do is determine habitat preferences and selection so that we can key in on important areas for us to set management priorities. We also wanna look at their home ranges, compare this before and after tidal restoration. And then finally, we're working on doing some occupancy um, modeling so that we can get estimates across the range in our study area and see how that relates to other factors like management type. So with that, I would like to thank everyone, especially at the Todd Lab at UC Davis, also the Department of Water Resources for funding support, and then my colleagues at the Department of Fish and Wildlife who helped me a lot out in the field. And now if we have any, I'll take questions. Also, if you're not watching in live time, feel free to email me. My email address is right here on the slide. And now I will attempt to pull this chat up. And if you can't, I can just relay the questions to you verbally. Okay, it was working earlier, but I don't see it working now, so. No worries. If we have any. <laughs> <laughs> How reliable are the GPS transmitters and are there any extended gaps of data uploads? So yeah, that is one issue that we are dealing with. I have a few turtles where 
the transmitters only lasted for a couple of months, but then I have maybe one or two turtles where they've lasted into the next year. We actually had a problem where the antennas were getting chopped off. So just them going through the veg or climbing on top of each other, it was uh, taking the antennas off, unfortunately. And then another problem too is reliability of the cell phone service. So if they're not getting a good signal, then you might get gaps in your data. Another one from Gwen, do the turtles switch to aquatic basking in the summer, like moving into warm shallows or on top of algal mats, if those are present? Yeah, I have actually seen them recently during some of our occupancy visual surveys using those algal mats a lot. Um, but then when those aren't available, they'll either be on the banks um, or if we have a basking platform out, they really tend to like those as well. Very good. We're going to hang on for just another minute here to see if we have any more questions come over from you too, but that was great stuff. Um, what do these turtles eat? So we haven't done any diet studies yet, but it's assumed that they eat a lot of crayfish. Actually, some of our turtles in a different experiment, they um, when they defecated, there were a lot of crayfish in their scat. And then uh, they also probably are eating algae and maybe small fish in the area. Aquatic invertebrates too. What transmitters were you using and would you recommend? So the transmitters, the company we were working with was Ecotone. And um, I think that they would be better if we could get a model that didn't have the external antenna, if we could figure out how to make it work without that, because that was really just the one big downside to the transmitters that we currently have. All right, question four. Are they feeding in these saltwater areas? And how are they dealing with the excess salt? Yeah, so that is something we have actually investigated. We did a salinity experiment on the turtles from our area. And it seems that they are actually adapted to live in higher salinities um, through regulating their blood osmolality. But uh, one of the things that they did end up doing in the lab was when salinity got to a certain point, they would stop eating. So it's maybe not a long-term strategy that they have. So potentially if salinities get too high, they're gonna have to eventually move into a less saline area. All right. Do the transmitters on female carapaces interfere with mating? Not that we've seen yet. So we try to place them far enough forward so that it doesn't uh, interfere with that. All right, last one. What is the weirdest place that GPS was recorded? Um, I don't know how to into the details I should get, but one of our turtles did actually take a trip to the city uh, fortunately, we got it back and we were able to take it back to the pond. <laughs> Great stuff. Thank you. We appreciate it. And next up is going to be Don Ashton. Very good. Probably. Um, here we go. I will share a screen here. And hopefully that all works and you guys can hear me now. Looks great. No, well, very good. Um, like I said, my name is Don Ashton. And I'm here to talk to, uh, we basically provide a comparison of Northwestern pond turtle populations from a dammed and free flowing fork on a, a Pacific Northwest river. And you see, I've got some co-authors listed here, James Patasso and uh, Dr. Hart Welsh really more of research collaborators. I didn't get them a whole lot of opportunity or any opportunity to really uh, uh, comment on this talk. But I uh, listed below that are our affiliations and some sponsors. And with that, I will move forward.
I think I will move forward. Huh. Okay, there we go. Educated biologist um, also participated in this study over the year. In fact, I even noticed uh, that Eric Meyer, uh, Eric Russell, I mean, is uh, on the chat there. So welcome, Eric. Uh, without all these people, the data that I'm going to be presenting here would not have been possible. Look like my screen share disappeared. Oh, we still see it. Oh, OK. Well, very good. Uh, so anyway, the, so that the, the two forks, one of the river forks was dammed in the 1960s, while the other remains free flowing. The free flowing fork generally uh, warms up through the summer, where on the dammed fork, we have a hypolimnetic release with cold water coming from the bottom of the reservoir. And uh, mean water temperature in July is about 6 point, I mean, 8.6 degrees colder on the dammed fork. So um, we do believe that's biologically significant. Slides aren't advancing that well here. Oh, there we go, now we're advancing too well. Uh, besides uh, changes in thermal regime, we also have uh, some changes in channel morpho morphology uh, with the reduction of floods uh, downstream of the dam, we get riparian encroachment builds up berms along the, the edge of the river. And, and again, we, uh, we lose that shallow edge water in exchange for a deep channel that down cuts. And on those lower pictures, you can see that illustrated on the, the left in 1961 or prior to the dam, um, that river is able to meander. But a dozen years after damming, uh, those banks are li lined with vegetation and the river no longer meanders. And just a brief uh, history of flow management to give some context on the dammed fork. In the 1960s and 70s, only about 10% of the water was retained within this watershed. The rest was pumped out of the basin uh, uh, for agricultural purposes. But due to declining anadromous fisheries in the 1980s, that allocation of water was increased to about 25% and uh, further increased in the 2000s to 49% of the water being retained in the watershed. So today I'm going to talk about data that we collected in the 1990s and the mid 2000s. So we've got that uh, increase in, in water uh, spanning the study periods. And um, important to point out that some of the turtles in this study are likely older than the dam itself. I'm going to synthesize the results of several studies. And like I mentioned, we've got two forks, the dammed and free flowing. We've got the two study periods I mentioned. So 1991 to 1994, and then 2005 to 2007. And uh, we're also going to look at three different turtle groups. Uh, we'll look at males, females, and juveniles separately. And on this slide, um, I'm introducing the color coding that I'll use throughout the rest of the talk. So you can see the, the blue for the uh, colder dammed fork, green for the uh, warmer uh, free-flowing fork. You know, you'll, you'll see that in the graphs here. So first thing we looked at is adult body size, because we noticed that uh, turtles of any given age seem to be smaller on the dammed fork relative to the free fork, the free flowing fork. And if you look at this uh, slide here, you'll see uh, there is a little bit of a change across the decades. And what we see on the dammed fork is a declining trend in body size, uh, which we do not see on the main fork. In fact, even a slight increase for the males. But this uh, becomes much more evident if we look at the juveniles. And for here on juveniles, we're really uh, going by age, not size. So we're looking at animals that are two to eight years old. And what we see with our green lines on the free flowing fork, um, very little difference across the decades. Whereas we look at the dammed fork, uh, we see they have slower growth rate in the 1990s and that uh, is exacerbated in the 2000s with even a slower growth rate. And that's what's really leading to our smaller adult body size. To take a little bit closer look at this and see if uh, water temperature might be causing this, we added some temperature data loggers and transmitters to about a, to, uh, 10 to 12 turtles on each fork 
And uh, we did that for three years in a row in the 2000s. This is an example of just one hydro or one uh, thermograph coming off of one uh, adult male. And this is actually looking at the whole year. Uh, we can zoom in on any part of that and look at details of a day or any length of time. But the main thing to point out here is lots of basking activity through the summer and into the autumn. Then the turtle is overwintering um, upland in the duff layer, probably even under a little bit of a snowpack here. Got a nice day in February, animal comes out to bask and then basking activity resumes uh, in the following spring. We also had uh, environmental data loggers that we could compare those temperatures to, to, to decide if they were on land, in the water, or you know, upland, um, near the riverbank, those kinds of things. But if we take all that data and sum it up, we see that the proportion of time spent basking uh, on the dammed fork is significantly greater than what we see on the free-flowing fork. And even with all that extra time or additional time basking on the dammed fork, those animals still don't quite reach the same overall existence temperature that we see on the free-flowing fork. In fact, they're about five degrees Celsius cooler overall. But how does this really play out on the turtles? We were noticing that particularly females on the dammed fork seemed really pudgy early on in the season, even as early as June. And uh, you'll notice here on this animal, uh, bulges of fat coming out of the inguinal cavities. Uh, this animal can't even retract into its shell in June. Uh, we see the same kind of pattern on some of the younger animals even in the main fork, but we're just going to look at uh, adults of known sex for this particular analysis where we'll use a uh, volumetric body condition index um, and compare this between the, the river forks. So what we find is for male turtles, um, we see uh, well, straight across for all of them, we see on the dammed fork in the blue bars, uh, higher volumetric body condition. So these animals, for some reason, are putting on more weight uh, relative to their counterparts on the free-flowing fork. But the other interesting trend to look at, you know, we have uh, increase from July to August in the males for both forks. But when we look over at the females, we see an increasing trend on the free-flowing fork, but on the dammed fork, the, the females start out heavy in July and they just stay heavy. Um, we're attributing this to uh, possibly that the females on the dammed fork are really, um, uh, they're allocating resources to lipid storage at the expense of growth and possibly reproduction, or maybe they're, uh, you know, it's taking them a couple of years. Maybe these animals are only reproducing once every couple of years, and this is what we're seeing in that, that signature there. Not totally sure. But from there, uh, we did an, uh, another small experiment where we, uh, we had been extracting blood samples and tissue samples for genetic work as well. But we, on a subset of these animals, we did blood draws at 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and 30 minutes after capture. And what we see here on the uh, dammed fork is an elevated level of uh, corticosteroids at the intermediate blood draw and then returning back down to a lower uh, level with the 30 minute mark. Now this uh, pattern is very indicative of chronic stress, although we don't know um, of people using this in turtles. Um, this has really uh, been done uh, very heavily in seabirds. And um, so anyway, we can we take that with a little bit of a grain of salt, but um, it does seem to be true and we do attribute this chronic stress to possibly be um, uh, cold stress. If we look at gravid females, we see that we've got a decrease in the percent of gravid females um, over time on the dammed fork and also a lower percentage uh, relative to the free flowing fork. Now the height of these bars are actually the count of the number of turtles that we palped. And this is by um, just reaching in and feeling for eggs uh, through the inguinal cavity. Um, notice the percents at the top of each bar though. That's the, uh, the percent of animals that were gravid out of the animals that were, were palped. And again, you know, basically twice as many on the free flowing fork compared to the dammed fork in the 1990s. While in the 2000s, this has dropped down to only 3% gravid on the dammed fork, while we still had 25% gravid on the free flowing fork. 
if we, no, and there was our 3%. If we take a look at uh, how that plays out for body size on these gravid females, um, we see that on the damned fork, uh, uh, we have count and body size, but we've got basically uh, a, a lot of our animals on the damned fork are below, for the gravid females, are below 160 millimeters, where on the free-flowing fork, most of the gravid females are above 160 millimeters. And so going back to some of those earlier talks, it's probable that the those larger animals are possibly producing larger or greater, larger clutches, maybe even larger eggs, we don't know. Um, but a big thing to think about is that palpation by, it can be really difficult on the smaller turtles. So we started wondering, well, are we missing some of the turtles that could be gravid out here at the smaller end? Or um, is, it just, is it just that they really are having a lower proportion of, uh, of gravid turtles? So we did x-ray a, a subset of turtles as well. We went back in 2009 to do this. And uh, we looked at 45 individuals, a uh, total of 52 x-rays. We did a, a multiple x-rays on a few individuals. And unfortunately, what we found is we had eggs only in the, the larger females. Uh, we had x-rayed uh, uh, females as small as 88 millimeters carapace length and as large as 182 millimeters. So I, that in part accounts for a lot of our low numbers is we really were probably x-raying turtles that were too small to even be carrying eggs. But that was really the point of this experiment to, uh, to see if any of those smaller animals that we were not able to, uh, to successfully palp um, if they were actually carrying eggs. And we did all these x-rays um, on the riverside. We didn't really take these turtles into the captivity. We just used a portable x-ray machine uh, running off a generator in the back of my car. So one other facet of information that we looked at is the spatial dynamics. And we're not really looking at movement per se, but more at uh, site fidelity. We're using um, location from recaptured turtles during our snorkel surveys. And um, so, you know, we don't really know where the turtles went. We just know where we found them. And we keep looking in the same spot over and over again. So the question we're asking here is, after overwintering on land, do these turtles return to the same aquatic site in subsequent years? And um, for site fidelity, we're going to call that, uh, for this analysis anyway, as being recaptured in a subsequent year uh, within 500 meters of the previous capture site. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> we uh, didn't really see any difference in direction upstream or downstream. Uh, so we used absolute value of the movement distance and piled everybody up against one axis. Um, no uh, real significance be difference between forks other than a, a very slight increase um, in distance between the decades on the damned fork, <clears throat> which possibly could represent um, changes in response to the, the changes in river management. But um, again, that difference was very small and don't want to make too big of a, a deal about that. The bigger difference that we see here is that most of the animals remained or were recaptured within 500 meters of their of previous year's capture location. And um, that was mostly, most true for females. But again, you know, nearly 60% of the males were captured uh, within 500 meters of their previous capture location. But then the males did kind of tail out a lot more. So the average uh, recapture distance for males was 279 meters, where for the females, it was 116, so basically 2.4 times greater in the male. Most interesting part of this, though, is when we look at the longer uh, distance between recaptures, the females actually had a higher number than the males. And we can take a look at it a little bit differently here. Uh, this is essentially that same data, but now instead of being percent of the individuals on the y-axis, we're looking at actual count. And so you can see we got lots of females returning closely, uh, fewer males. But when we get out to, um, you know, out to one kilometer, two kilometer, even three kilometers, um, males are fairly well represented, but then they drop out completely. And our few longest distance movers are the females out here at five and six kilometers. And I just popped up some images of some 
and, and data for a few individuals. This is one of our longer recapture distance males at 2.7 kilometers moving downstream in a period of six weeks. This, uh, we've got a female that moved 5.8 kilometers in a round trip journey in 10 months and another female uh, 6.3 kilometers upstream in 11 months. So again, males tending to have a uh, uh, longer distance between recaptures, but uh, females having all of the longest uh, recapture distances. And um, I should point out some of these uh, movements do uh, span the decades. And we did not find a huge difference between the decades, except like I said, slight difference on the dammed fork. Um, uh, no, yeah, those bars represent 500 meter bins. So if we move on to our next slide, we can kind of lead towards our concluding questions. You know, are dammed turtles dammed? Um, well, we do still see recruitment of young turtles, but they have a slower growth rate and leading that leads to a reduced adult body size. Looks like we have lower reproductive output and um, it seems like the turtles are reluctant to relocate, even though um, I showed on that previous slide, they are certainly capable of moving uh, large distances, uh, you know, six kilometers, but um, they don't seem to do that very often. So in, in summary, the dam turtles could use some help out there. Uh, they can also teach us too. They are long lived residents of the ecosystem. And um, by studying them, we can learn about the ecosystem and offer information to feed into river management. And the basic problem here that we have at our study site, uh, the dammed fork is now managed as a cold water fishery, fisheries, uh, where it's also the, the home for these warm water species. Um, and essentially when the, the dam was put in, uh, it blocked hundreds of miles of salmonid habitat upstream and fisheries managers are trying to uh, place that habitat now downstream where the turtles want to live. So the solution to this is really to provide habitat heterogeneity. Um, there is a lot of restoration going on. Uh, and if we can design sites that provide warm edgewaters and backwaters while still uh, retaining cold water in the channel, um, then I think we can provide uh, better habitat for these turtles without compromising fishery objectives. Um, another way to help maintain that over the long run is to be sure to provide annual variation in flow so that uh, we don't build up those armored uh, uh, vegetation banks that build up the berms and separate the, the floodplain from the channel. And all of that will just will help uh, restore ecosystem function, which ultimately uh, benefits the anadromous fishes as well as all other native species in the drainage. So. With that, I do want to thank folks for, for listening. Um, I know there's a lot of questions about turtles and I'm glad I'm following a, a few other uh, authors who had uh, provided some background information so I didn't have to go into the basics on turtles. But anyway, I can answer some questions if my house isn't on fire yet. Um, with that, I was looking at my chat. Yes, um, so I see a question here. Uh, we are creating pockets of uh, warmer habitat and that's exactly um, what's going on now. Or these recommendations are being fought forward. And uh, it's interesting to note too that it's not really just the turtles and foothill yellow-legged frogs that are benefiting from these shallow warmer areas, but also the, we're finding that the anadromous fishes are using those areas as well. Um, at least the, the small fry. It seems that they hang out in those warm edges and then they just dart out into the cold water to feed and then return back to the warm water. Reading another chat here. Usually when an isolated animal gets smaller, it might mean that their food source has become uh, spare or scarce. Um, can their food sources be increased? Well, that was part of why we looked at that body condition. And as I pointed out too, 
those um, smaller turtles on the dammed fork were certainly not malnourished. Um, in fact, they had higher volumetric body conditions than those on the free flowing fork. And when we're out there snorkeling, there's a lot of food. Um, so yeah, we don't think that availability of the resources is the problem. It's more, um, it, it may be the ability to assimilate those resources uh, because they're not getting their body temperature high enough uh, to, to, you know, to, to assimilate the food that they're able to gather. Um, also, they are spending more time basking, which would cut into time feeding. Hopefully that answers that question too. And did you see question one, Don, that was uh, what do you attribute the pudginess of the turtles on the dam fork to? Um, yeah, I didn't see that question, but here's the answer. Uh, we think that they may, uh, it, it, particularly for the females, but it looks like maybe for, for the males a little bit as well, that they're allocating resources to lipid storage at the expense of both growth and then for the females, uh, reproduction, or maybe, you know, saving up two years uh, to get to reproduction. Um, but yeah, yeah, we think it's basically storing fat. Um, and I don't know if they're, if that helps keep them warm. I think it's more of a, um, you know, really just trying, trying to, to store resources because they're not really sure. Um, I think they're in a, 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 well, a stressful environment. Again, like that corticosteroid um, analysis suggested. Um, could a shift in diet due to the dam and distance traveled per day being shifted by the structure cause the pudginess? Uh, what is that? Repeat that again. There's question two. Could a shift in diet due to the dam and distance traveled per day being shifted by that structure cause the pudginess? Um, I suppose that's possible, although we don't see too much of a, a shift in their movements. Um, and as far as diet, we didn't actually do any diet analysis. And so it is possible that there's uh, different types of food available. Uh, for example, on the free flowing fork, um, there are a lot more tadpoles available uh, where tadpoles are fairly scarce on the dammed fork. Um, but again, we're, yeah, we did not look into diet at all, uh, but we didn't feel that that lack of food per se was, a, was an issue for these animals. And the last question, in general, how long in years does it take a female to reach sexual maturity, forming eggs, at the dammed sites versus free flowing sites? Oh gosh, we have a whole paper out on that. Um, and it's looking like the, on the, the dammed fork, it potentially takes quite a bit longer, um, but, uh, you know, maybe even out into 20 years, I think that might be a little bit extreme uh, because we are, uh, uh, um, when we pelt the animals, we have not found anywhere we still have growth rings to look at. Uh, so we're kind of backdating from some of our marked animals to, to get ages. Um, but generally speaking, um, they're reaching a reproductive age uh, much earlier on the warmer free flowing fork than they are on the colder dammed fork. And I would say probably twice as many years uh, on the dammed fork as an approximation. Uh, but on the free flowing fork, we're looking at, at maybe six years uh, for females, six to eight years to maturity. And uh, males, we're seeing secondary characteristics start to develop on some of the males as young as four years, but more typically um, six years. Thanks, Don. That was the last one. Okay, yeah. By the time we get over to the damned fork, another thing, uh, um, even though we can age them out a little bit further because they tend to bask more on wood rather than rock, we're still just not seeing um, eggs in the younger females. Thanks. Thank you, Don. All right, I should probably stop my share here and let you move on.
All right, is that working for you guys? Do you have it back now? Absolutely, thank you. Very good. Okay, I think I'm ready to go. I'll share my screen. And let's see if I can see the chat. Okay, so hi everyone. I am Raul Araya Donoso. I'm a graduate student at Arizona State University in the Evolutionary Biology PhD program. And well, I work with Dr. Skinner Kasumi and Greg Dolby. And I want to talk to you today about this project we have in collaboration with the Arizona Game and Fish Department. And we are gonna change topic. We are going to move now to invasive species and how they affect turtles. And in this case, I want to talk to you about the factors that determine the invasions of crayfish and bullfrogs in the um, Sonorama turtle populations here in Arizona. So I would like to begin talking about our study species, the Sonora nocturnal, Kinosternum sonoriensis sonoriense. And this is one of the most widely distributed turtles here in Arizona. So here you can see like in this red area is their distribution. And it's also like the Kinosternum species that lives in a more arid environment. And this species, uh, faces many different threats because uh, it still have a small geographic range and it faces the rough and the effects of climate change. It's also affected by predation by invasive species and it faces habitat degradation. But this species is not categorized as endangered still. However, the sister subspecies of Kinosternum sonoriensis sonoriense, uh, Kinosternum sonoriense longifemorale, is categorized as endangered. So in this picture, you can see it has this blue distribution that corresponds to the sonoira turtle, Kinosternum sonoriense longifemorale. So our main concern is that we don't want the sonora turtle to be as endangered as the sonoira turtle. Because like not managing a vulnerable species will increase the likelihood that this species will be in a higher risk category in the future. So we need to take actions to manage that. Okay, so I told you that one of the threats that the Sonora turtle faces are invasive species. So the main invasives, you know, the main freshwater invasive species here in Arizona are these two crayfish species and these bullfrogs. And these species are bad for us and they have effects on the turtles' populations because they can predate upon hatchlings of turtles and can also be reservoirs from some diseases such as ranavirus. And just to give you some context, these animations show the spread of this invasive species through time. And you can see that, that they are both widely spread in Arizona. Here you can see the bullfrogs, here the crayfishes. So in present dates, they are widely spread throughout the state. So we need to take actions to manage these populations and to preserve our turtles. So, the main idea of this study is that it's relevant for us to understand these interactions and the ecological characteristics that can affect the invasion. Therefore, we can develop a scientific-based management in order to improve the health of the turtles' populations. So our main objective with this study was to determine the environmental variables that are associated with the abundance of these invasive species in the populations of mud turtle. So for example, these are some of the ponds that these mud turtles are living in. So in order to do this, we use 
available data, available occurrence records since 1975 for the three main taxa we are studying. And we use several databases, public databases. And our final data set had um, around 6,000 occurrence data. And as you can see here, we have the distribution of the mud turtles. This is the density of mud turtle occurrences and also the occurrences of the invasive species that are very, um, they tend to occur in similar environments. Also, we gather environmental variables that could explain how are associated the abundance of the invasive species and the mud turtles, such as altitude, the distance to the main river trunk, distance to nearest road, which could be a measure of anthropogenic disturbance, and also the stream persistence. That means if the stream is intermittent or permanent throughout the year. So, we measured the um, abundance of crayfish and bullfrogs in each one of these turtle populations. Uh, so our study unit was the turtle population. And we assessed the effects of these environmental variables on the abundance of the invasives using a GLM with a log mean function. So um, the first results I want to show you is descriptive, like we are not analyzing the relationship between variables, we are only seeing where are occurring the different taxa we are studying. So the main thing is that all the three taxa use a similar habitat regarding the distance to the nearest road, the distance to the main river and the altitude. But uh, we found an interesting differences in the um, stream persistence where the crayfishes tend to occur more in perennial um, streams compared to the other species that are more present in intermittent species, the streams. So then when we analyze the relationship of these environmental variables with the abundance of the invasives in the turtle populations, we found first regarding the stream persistence as similar to what we found before, that crayfish tend to occur more in perennial streams and bullfrogs tend to occur more in intermittent streams. So this makes sense since crayfish are more dependent of water. So they are more associated with these permanent streams. And also bullfrogs uh, present um, higher dispersal ability and can also survive in terrestrial habitats. So these results make sense to us. Then when we assess the distance to the main river, we found that both species tend to be more abundant near to the main river. And this was also described for different invasive species that their spread is facilitated uh, by downstream flow, like the water flow in the rivers facilitate their occurrence like in the main trunks. And um, well, it has also been described that higher water flow will facilitate the spread of bullfrogs. So these results also make sense to us, like having more invasives near to the main river. Then um, for the distance to rows, we didn't, we were expecting to find that the invasive species were going to be more abundant uh, near to the roads because they were going to be closer to the um, anthropogenic disturbance. But this wasn't the pattern we found. Uh, we didn't find our relationship for the crayfishes. And we found that bullfrogs tend to occur farther from the roads. So in this case, we, we cannot think that there is a direct association to the, um, these variables. Um, and one explanation could be like the roads not necessarily are a source of the invasion of these species because it has been described that invasive species tend to be more abundant near to the source of invasion. So that could be something to consider like we need to know where are these invasive species coming from. And um, well, it's also necessarily to state that caveat that this study has um, that as we are using available databases, 
uh, there are many sampling biases, like because this is where the surveys were made um, in the reports of the Arizona Game and Fish Department, and also where people have found these species in, and published them in public databases. So that could be also a bias of these results. And finally, regarding the altitude, uh, we found a positive relationship. We found invasive species being more abundant uh, in higher altitudes, which was contrary to our expectations because both the species are described to have lower, lower fitness in higher elevations. So we're thinking that this might be associated to other environmental variables such as climate for example, temperature or precipitation. And as well, um, it's relevant to consider that the variables we are assessing in this study are also correlated between them. For example, being at more altitude mean that means also that you are farther from the main river trunk. So there's possibly an association between those variables that we are not seeing with these results. So this is one result that is worth more analysis in the future, and that will be something that we are expecting to do. So, to in order to sum up, like all these analyses have implications for management and turtle conservation. Why? Because we can develop a risk assessment tool. And this is science-based management. This will help us to detect the variables that are related to the abundance of the invasive species in turtle populations. Therefore, we can define management strategies. For example, we can propose now with this result some SARS-SYNC dynamics uh, regarding where these species are more abundant or not. Also, if we want to do like invasive species removal, we know in which turtle populations these invasives are doing worse. So we can do more effective removal of invasive species. And all of this has the ultimate goal to improve the health of the wild turtle populations. And this can be applied to different cases of different invasive species or other threats. So that's the main idea of this study. So that will be it. Um, I want to thank all the people from the Arizona Game and Fish Department and from my school and of course to the Turtle Survival Alliance. And I'll be happy to answer your questions, but I cannot find the chat. So I will need uh, David helps with the questions. Not a problem. Thank you, Raul. We're gonna hang on just for a little bit. We don't have questions yet. But we're gonna give our viewers on YouTube a chance to get those in before we move on to the next presenter. Sure. Are there any specific areas that you believe should be the focus of conservation efforts? Yes, so there are some populations and some areas of them on the distribution of the mud turtles that have very low invasion of the of crayfish and bullfrogs. I think one main concern for us is to preserve those populations, like try to avoid the invasives getting there. Excellent. We'll hang on for just one more second before we say bye to you. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen.
All right, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Monzo and I'm a graduate from the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, today I'll be talking about a project that began in 2019 to inform the listing decision of the Western Pond Turtle Species Complex under the Endangered Species Act. So this was a student project led by Brad Schaefer and Peter Scott at UCLA in collaboration with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and most recently the US Geological Survey. Okay, so the Western pond turtle was long considered a single polytypic species along the west coast of North America from Washington, USA, south to Northern Baja California, Mexico. In 1992, the US Fish and Wildlife Service was petitioned to list the Western pond turtle under the Endangered Species Act. Um, at this time, it was recognized as a single species. And although it was not federally listed, it did receive some level of protection in the three US states where it occurs. So that's Washington, Oregon, and California. In 2012, the US Fish and Wildlife Service was once again, petitioned to list the Western pond turtle. Today, however, we recognize two species, Actinemys marmorata from Washington, south through California's San Joaquin Valley, and Actinemys pallida from south of San Francisco Bay to Baja California. The recognition of the Western pond turtle as two distinct species established a new baseline for separate management and conservation actions. So it also created a challenge as most of the information on site-specific threats and population declines predate the genetic division of the Western pond turtle. And this information is also scattered across the published and unpublished literature and had not yet been analyzed separately for each species. So we analyze the literature using the location of each study population. We considered all populations from Washington and Oregon as marmorata, all from Mexico as pallida, and we use the range delineation of each species in California to tell the two apart. So separating the information geographically allowed us to analyze the threats for each species. We first identified site-specific threats to Western pond turtle populations uh, through an extensive literature review based on all available peer-reviewed literature, as well as published and unpublished government agency reports. We identified 13 major threat categories. Some of these are more historical, such as habitat alteration and commercial harvesting, and others are emerging threats related to climate change, such as drought, wildfires, uh, flooding, and rising temperatures. We analyze the severity of each threat using a scoring system to evaluate how a potential threat affected a population. So here are a couple of observations related to the 2012 to 2015 California drought. The first observation received a score of one because the population size decreased. And the second observation received a score of two as this same drought event led to the extirpation of a population. Once we assigned a score to each observation, we calculated the sum and the mean under each threat category and we use these values to rank the threats. So here are the top five threats for each species. They're ranked in order of sum score and then by mean score. On the far right, we have the number of observations under each category. Uh, we expect threats with the highest sum scores to result in higher incidences of negative effects and extirpations. The mean score represents the average impact we expect a threat to have on a population when it does occur. So for example, under pallida, predation by bullfrogs and pass has a mean score of one, as it was consistently negative in all six observations. But floods have a score of 0.56, so they weren't always associated with negative effects. So predation by bullfrogs and bass on hatchlings emerged as a high ranking threat for marmorata and pallida, which Griffin will talk more about in the following presentation. Drought and habitat alteration also emerged as top threats for both species. So for pallida, drought was the highest ranked threat. And although it was lower for marmorata, the mean score for drought was by far the highest for the species. 
So this suggests that negative impacts associated with drought are more commonly observed for Pallida, but that it is important yet less prevalent in the more mesic range of Marmorata. To observe where Western pond turtles are maintaining healthy populations, we analyzed data from trapping and hand capture surveys conducted over the last 26 years, and we compared the mean annual captures at several sites. So relatively healthy populations, those in blue and green, tend to occur along the Trinity River in California, parts of California's Central Valley, and sparsely along the Central and Southern California coast. Sites with low mean annual captures of less than one occur from Kern County, south through San Diego County, and throughout undisclosed locations along the Mojave River. So to further compare population estimates between the two species, we performed a t-test within each population size category and found that most populations of either species contain one to 50 turtles. And within this category, we found that Pallida had significantly lower population numbers than Marmorata, as indicated by the mean. So given that drought was a top threat for both species that we could parameterize, we modeled the future population viability of a Western pond turtle population with drought as a catastrophe. First, we parameterized our PVA models in Vortex, which is a software that can model the fate of a population. We used estimates of reproductive rates and mortality rates for Western pond turtles from the primary literature. And overall, we designed a single species PVA model, as we don't have evidence that the two species differ drastically in birth, death, or maturation rates. Generally, we used demographic parameters from Germano's long-term study in Kern County, California. So this study provides annual survivorship rates among different age classes, which most studies lack. However, Holland did report survivorship estimates in 1994. Both researchers report relatively low mortality rates among adults, but the juvenile mortality rates differ drastically between the two studies. We explored these differences on the following slide by running the model using Germano's mortality rates, and then running it a second time using Holland's mortality rates. For population one, we use Germano's mortality schedule for juveniles and adults. And for population two, we used Holland's mortality rates while keeping all other parameters constant. Each model was run a total of 100 times over 100 years. Uh, so each of these lines represents a different fate the population may experience. Over time, the population size of each simulation fluctuates as a function of the Western pond turtles, annual reproductive and mortality rates. The darkest lines running through each model represent the mean population size of each model through time. And as you can see, none of the simulations went extinct in population one when using Germano's mortality schedule. By contrast, 100% of the simulations in population two resulted in extinction within um, 100 years when using Holland's mortality schedule. Uh, because the, the juvenile mortality rates reported by Germano and Holland are different, we use the model to further explore the sensitivity of population one to first year mortality. While keeping all parameters healthy and, and stable, we increased the annual first year mortality rate as shown on the x-axis to visualize when the probability of extinction would reach 100% on the y-axis. This sensitivity analysis showed that annual first year mortality rates above 81% resulted in a 100% probability of extinction, meaning that within 100 years, all 100 of the simulations went extinct. Germano's first year mortality rate on the left does not result in extinction, while Holland's first year mortality rate on the right results in a 100% probability of extinction. So given that the differences um, in adult female mortality were a little different as well, um, we decided to do the same thing with that, but they did not produce similar results. They were both low enough to have no effect on population viability. For the purpose of our study, we used the parameters from population one to further investigate the effects of catastrophic drought. 
We focused on droughts that last a minimum of four years as they are known to cause major population declines. So there have been three such drought events in California in the last century. Using the same parameters from population one, we performed another PVA, but this time we included the effects that three random drought events would have on reproduction and survival. We found that the mean population size decreased over time and that 15 out of 100 simulations went extinct. This means that healthy populations such as the one in Germano's study could be at risk of extirpation if the frequency or the duration of 100 year droughts increases as they are expected to with climate change. To explore the effects of increasing drought frequency under climate change, we increase the number of droughts while keeping all other parameters constant. As shown on the previous slide, a current estimated drought frequency of three droughts per 100 years resulted in a 15% probability of extinction. An increase to five drought events resulted in a 50% probability of extinction. Overall, as drought severity and frequency increase with climate change, the model predicts that the likelihood of recovery will decrease, especially for populations with low census sizes. Overall, the top five threats for Marmorata in order of decreasing impact are predation by bullfrogs and bass, pathogens, habitat alteration, drought, and harvesting. For Palata, the top five are drought, predation, floods, habitat alteration, and wildfires. Although they are ranked differently, predation, drought, and habitat alteration emerged as top threats for both species. In particular, aquatic habitat loss and fragmentation is important to consider under drought conditions, especially for Palata, for which drought is the number one threat. Furthermore, assuming the trapping data for Marmorata and Palata are relatively unbiased with respect to trapping effort, Palata populations within the small to medium sized class appear to exist in lower numbers than Marmorata. So this suggests that they might be more vulnerable to population declines. Although both species face similar threats, given its current population trends and increased vulnerability to climate related issues, such as drought, floods, and wildfires, we recommend that conservation actions should first focus on Palata to prevent further population declines. So I'd like to acknowledge the following field ecologists for providing data for this project, as well as the following organizations for funding. So thank you for listening and um, I'll be happy to take any questions if there are any. Okay, so none yet. Any questions yet, but we'll give it just a minute before we move on to Griffin. We'll give it just a minute longer. What pathogens are problematic and how might they be managed? Right, so some of the pathogens that um, we read about were um, a shell disease in a lot of northern populations. Um, as of yet, I don't think they identified what kind of pathogen that was. Um, but I think there are research efforts to figure that out. Um, and then I think there's, there's been a lot of like unidentified pathogens that cause either the shell disease or respiratory disease, um, but they haven't been able to identify what they are yet. Right. Any direct study areas in the major wildlife zones of California? I'm sorry. What? Any direct study? You can go ahead and answer that one, but I've got another one that you don't see. Um, we weren't really looking at 
specific study areas in California, um, just looking at pretty much um, any work that prior field ecologists have done. Um, so we weren't really focusing on a particular population or study area. All right. Are the population estimates shown for Marmorata based on studies, mark recapture, or just number caught like in one week? So we made sure that all of these were mark recapture um, just so that we can keep, keep track of like how many unique turtles were caught each year. Great, we're gonna give it just another minute and then we'll pass it off to Chris. And that's it. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, so that looks good. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Griffin Nicholson. So as with the work just presented by Stephanie, this research began as an undergraduate senior project at UCLA, co-advised by Peter Scott and Brad Schaefer, and we collaborated with the USGS. So today I'll be discussing about part of our research, which we recently published in the journal Pure J. And I'll be discussing how we um, assess the demographic trends of Western pond trolls over time and we also assessed what may have caused these demographic trends. So as Stephanie mentioned, Western pondrels are facing severe threats which are causing declines in both population size and in range. And in addition to that, recent studies in the field have found that there seems to be a decrease in the number of females and the number of juveniles of Western pondrels. And this has led to two hypotheses. First, that female biased road mortality is resulting in increasingly male biased Western pondrel populations. And second, that high juvenile mortality from non-native predatory species like bullfrogs is resulting in reduced recruitment. Despite this concern of the demographic changes, they have not been quantified long-term previously. And the causes of the, these potential causes of the demographic changes have been understudied overall. So to remedy this, our objectives were two. We had two objectives. Our first objective was to quantify trends in sex ratio and mean carapace length over time. Um, in this case, mean carapace length was served as a proxy for age, the average age of populations, because that was the parameter we were interested in to see if recruitment has changed over time. And it was also important to us to assess as the species has recently been separated into two distinct species, we want to assess them separately because as Stephanie showed in her presentation, um, each species is facing different severity of each threat and also uh, different um, extent of each threat. And our second objective after quantifying these demographic trends were to assess whether they may be explained by road mortality and invasive predators, which was represented by bullfrogs in this study. So to do this, we, um, for our first objective in assessing the demographic trends over time, we did a combination of museum specimens as historical data and contemporary field studies as our contemporary data. So to collect our museum data, we analyzed approximately 500 museum specimens at three different museums. And those were California Academy of Sciences, the Museum of Vertebrae Zoology at Berkeley, and the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History. And these came out to be about 82% of the preserved specimens in museum collections. And for each specimen, we took a variety of data, but for our particular demographic interests, we collected size, the midline carapace length, which you can see being measured to the left. And we recorded the sex of each species based on plastal curvature and tail length of each specimen. And other information we got from online museum databases, including the collection date, and the collection location. And that was important because uh, as the species separation is fairly recent, many of the specimens have not been reclassified as Marmorata and Pallida. And for our analysis, we again did it separately by species. So we had to reclassify each specimen we found. An important thing to note about our use of museum specimens as historical data is that museum specimens are often used to determine distribution changes 
but not often used for to assess demographic changes. And our study shows that this could be very helpful for conservation. So after recording our museum specimen data, we combined this with contemporary field studies, which was provided to us by Western Pantro field researchers. I have listed them at the bottom of this slide. And the map to the right shows roughly in the circles where the data came from for the contemporary field studies. And we extracted the same data for each field captured um, turtle as the specimens in the museums. So this included midline carapace length, sex, um, collection date, and collection location. And we did account for recaptures in our analyses as well. And then we combined it with the historical museum data to quantify our demographic trends, which I'll now talk about each demographic trend. So for our sex ratio trends, we did a logistic regression of the probability of a turtle sex through time. And we did uh, three different regressions for each species. We did one of the historical data isolated, one with the contemporary data isolated, and one with the combination. And I've labeled those on the figures. So as you can see, with the com combined um, data sets, the, there's a significant um, increase in male bias over time. Starts about even in the historical data for both species, but they both have seen an increase in male bias over time. And in Marmorata, this holds true for both the isolated historical and isolated contemporary um, regressions. But in Palata, we're actually seeing an increase in females in the current populations, which was curious to us. And we believe that this is due to a form of population filtering in Southern California, in which there's been an elimination of the anthropogenically modified uh, populations, the anthropogenically impacted populations. And the ones that remain are remote and have restricted access to, so they're fairly healthy. They have not seen the uh, demographic impacts that the others would have seen because they have been eliminated completely. So what we're seeing is likely not overall population recovery um, reflected by demographics, but instead an elimination of those populations that would have been impacted. So for our um, assessment of trends for age structure, uh, which was again, we used average carapace length as a proxy for age structure, the average age. We saw a significant difference between the two species and we found that Marmorata has actually seen a significant increase in the average age. So that indicates reduced recruitment as has been hypothesized. However, Pallida has been very constant through time. Um, and this again, we believe is due to the population filtering I discussed for the increase in females in Pallida in the contemporary samples. So likely they're the populations that would have seen an increase in the average age um, have been completely eliminated and the ones that remain are fairly healthy and viable which is why we're seeing this kind of consistent trend through time. So after assessing these demographic trends, we found um, for the sex ratio analysis that both species have seen an increase in male bias. So we want to look at the potential cause of that. And we used our contemporary data sets to assess the effects of roadways on sex ratios and see if female bias mortality may be the cause. We did two independent analyses. We looked at the relationship between sex ratio and the distance to the nearest road. And we looked at the relationship between sex ratio and the density of surrounding roads, which may be a, a potentially a better predictor of vehicular mortality of turtles. And for our analyses, our sex ratios came from the most recent seven years of contemporary studies. And we pulled, pooled both Western Pontrol species because this gave us greater statistical power and there's no indication that there is a difference in nesting ecology. So we thought that this would um, be reflecting of the trends. So, and we used ArcGIS to calculate the distance to the nearest road and the total road density. And this is what we found for our first analyses of Western Pontrol sex ratios relationship with distance to the nearest road. And what we found was as the um, populations um, became further from roads, they became more even sex ratio. Um, so more one-to-one -one from male to female, while populations that were much close to roads uh, had significantly uh, more male bias. And there's also a lot more variability in sites that were um, closer than 220 meters to a road than sites which were greater than 220 meters from a road. So we found a significant difference based on the distance to the nearest road. We also found um, in our analyses of Western pontrol sex ratios based on road density, that there is a significant increase in male bias 
as the row density around populations increased. And this was within 400 meters of the body of water each uh, population was associated with in our contemporary data. So both of these analyses, while they're correlational, um, they're showing that there is likely um, female, um, male bias in populations that are close to rows and have high density of rows nearby, indicating that female bias row mortality could be a causal factor of the increase in male bias we've seen in both populations. And then after, at least for Marmorata, we saw an increase in the average age of populations, which indicates reduced recruitment. So we looked at um, if, if invasive predators um, would be the cause of this. And we utilize bullfrogs as our invasive predator because they're often more visible and identifiable than other um, predators of juvenile turtles. And you can see that here's a bullfrog in this picture um, that was in a, I sorry, a turtle that is, was in a bullfrog stomach exhibiting their um, consumption of juvenile Western pontrels. So we use them because they're more visible and also often associated with other invasive predators. So for our analyses, again, we use the contemporary data sets and we compared in their most recent seven years, the sex ratios between sites that had bullfrogs present and sites that did not have bullfrogs co-occurring with them. And what we found was that sites with bullfrogs present um, had a significantly higher average carapace length and thus age than sites with bullfrogs absent. And we again pooled the two species for this analysis, which could um, have some bias because marmorata is typically larger than palata. However, we did split this up by both species in our analyses and we found the trend stayed consistent, but the combination again gave us greater statistical power. So just like with the roadways, this was a correlational analysis but it does support that the presence of bullfrogs is resulting in an increased average age of populations and reduced recruitment, um, which may be the causal factor of the trend in increased age we saw in Marmorata. Okay, so to conclude, um, we looked at the demographic changes of both species and we found that both have undergone some demographic changes and both have seen an increase in male bias but only Marmorata and our trends saw an increase in the average age of populations indicating reduced recruitment. And this could be very important to the long-term health of these species, because even though, as we've heard today, that they have very long lifespans, if, they are not if there's no recruitment occurring and there's no females in the populations, most of the females are being eliminated, then this could lead to long-term declines. So furthermore, we, uh, we saw that roads and non-native predators of juvenile Western pontrels like bullfrogs um, are significantly um, associated with some of these demographic trends. And while we, it was correlational, both of them seem to be potential causal factors of the demographic trends uh, we witnessed. And finally, we would also like to restate that natural history collections can provide historical insights into demographic trends as we have exhibited here. So they can be important tools for conservation in the future to look at changes in demographics. Okay, and we'd, I'd like to thank all of the museum curatorial staff who gave us access to museum collections and provide their time and assistance. And I'd also like to thank all of the field ecologists who provided data for these analyses. And I've also put the citation for our published uh, work down below for those who are more interested in finding out more. Okay, thank you so much for listening to my talk. And I will take questions now. I see the chat is open. Okay. Um, so first question, uh, dumb question, but how slash who, sorry, it's not a dumb question, but that, that was how it was phrased. So I'm just saying that. Um, dumb question, but how slash who is introducing the bullfrogs? Um, so bullfrogs, um, at least in a lot of locations where they spread, um, are usually, they, there was bullfrog farms growing, a lot of them have escaped. Um, there's a lot that could be um, introduced by people. So there's a variety of ways that they've been introduced. Um, people could have them as pets and introduce them to different um, ponds and areas. But a lot of the recent distribution is due to spread of bullfrogs um, from their original introductions. Um, they've spread a lot through, um, they're very widespread throughout the world. Okay. Um, any other questions? There's one more here. Do you think that the effects of bullfrogs and co-distributed non-native species can be separated? Um, could you repeat that? 
do you think that the effects of bullfrogs compared to the code distributed not other non-native species can be separated or discerned? Um, I think to an extent, um, so it's different non-native species are likely um, transported in different ways. However, a lot of the places where you see them, they're often associated with each other. So I, there's likely, a, I, at least I would believe that there would be a relationship between um, introduction sites, so where there's more access for species to be introduced, um, which is like more anthropogenically impacted areas, which is often why we see these species being introduced together. Um, I know there's also some work on looking at kind of looking at the interactions between different invasives together, such as bullfrogs and crayfish, and how um, sometimes they actually kind of like can limit each other. So, and sometimes they help each other as well. But bullfrogs and crayfish seem to have contradictory effects, which limiting their, when they co-occur, limiting their effects. Based on the bullfrog being a lot of crayfish, basically. Another question from um, Barry's. How do you explain, or how would you explain the high abundance of Western pond turtles in Central Valley at uh, where bullfrogs are also numerous? Yeah, um, so, well, so some populations you still find a lot of turtles, um, but they may not have the recruitment due to some of these predators of juveniles. Um, so that could be one reason why you're seeing a lot of populations that since the turtles are long lived and if there's a lot of adults and not much affecting them, um, like other anthropogenic impacts, then those populations could remain for a long time. Um, also, there could just be the bullfrogs could have just reached there and their effects have not been seen yet as the bullfrogs continue to expand. Um, recommendations for a distance of barrier fencing from roadway bridges. Um, so, well, based on our data, we saw like a shift in significance at about 220 meters away from the Western Pontreal populations. So at about 220 meters would be, I'd say, a good place to do some conservation measures to potentially protect turtles from uh, vehicular mortality. So that would be kind of the distance I would recommend um, looking at for future conservation, at least based on our, our data sets. Okay. Thank you very much, Griffin. Thank you. Stop the sharing. All right, folks. All right. So uh, my name is uh, Max Lambert, and I'm a postdoc at UC Berkeley. Um, and I talked to you today about some of the work that's done with colleagues um, kind of all, all over the place about uh, red ear sliders and doing some experimental removals to see how they impact native species, particularly Western pond turtles um, and imperiled species you've heard a lot about today. Um, size of advanced. Uh, before I go too far, I really want to give a shout out to the whole team of folks who have done a lot of work over the years to actually advance this. Um, our insight into regular sliders um, and their, you know, their impact on native species. We, uh, the team tend to say that everyone loves turtles, which is something you've heard Bruce Brody talk about earlier today. Um, and we really think that turtles are a really great way to build um, inclusive and diverse um, conservation biologists. Um, and we've done a really good job of that, we think, with our team. Um, we look forward to uh, seeing turtle conservation continue to keep advancing in that, in that way. So uh, today's stories are revolving around two different species of turtle, the Western pond turtle and Miser actinemius marmorata, which as you've heard today is also uh, two different species, but for today I always consider it one for the point of uh, this discussion. And the uh, red ear slider turtle, Trachea scripta elegans, um, which is one of the most uh, invasive species in the world. So red ear sliders are probably one of the species that um, most turtle biologists around the world are really familiar with. Um, they are native to the eastern and central United States, but are pretty much pervasive across the U.S. now um, and are found on every continent on Earth except for Antarctica. If you look at a map of iNaturalists, uh, Western Europe, parts of Asia, and some parts of Latin America and Africa just light up with observations of red ear slider turtles. Um, the IUCN Invasive Species Task Force considers them one of the world's 100 worst alien invasive species, um, in large part because um, they are super prevalent in the pet and food trade. Um, which leads to them being introduced in a lot of places um, because people dump them. 
uh, spiders get pretty mean and nasty and big uh, pretty fast. And so they make pretty unpleasant pets. Um, and his map probably a little out of date at this point in time. Uh, but there's been a lot of work um, over the past, say, 20 years or so, uh, trying to ask whether sliders have impact on native species and ecosystems. Um, it's a pretty common dominant narrative among turtle biologists that sliders are really bad. Um, but I'd argue that the actual evidence for the impact of sliders on native species is pretty limited. There are a handful of experiments from Europe, pre predominantly in laboratory aquariums or small mesocosms, that suggest that sliders outcompete native species, um, particularly native emmies and moremies. Um, in Europe. Um, the kind of problem with more laboratory mesocosm based experiments is they tend to inflate the effects of inter specific competition. Um, so you really need some field experiments to tease apart really how impactful sliders might be on native species. So we'll talk about some of that today. Um, of course, the focal species that we really care about in our system in California is the Western pond turtle. Um, I won't go into detail on this because you've heard time talks today, um, but species that ranges really, really broadly across the West Coast, um, but which has experienced pretty tremendous declines in the northern and southern parts of its range um, for a variety of reasons, from disease to habitat loss to invasive species um, that consume their, their juveniles. Um, Kind of one of the, the paradoxes though, is that they actually can do pretty well in some urban ponds. Um, and so we've highlighted urban areas as kind of a hot spot for possible conservation for Western pond turtles uh, in the West. The paradox of that though, is that urban areas are also kind of the hot spot of slider introductions, because again, given that they are pet turtles where you have lots of people, you have lots of pets and therefore you have more uh, slider introductions. And so if we're really gonna think about urban areas um, or really anywhere in California or the West, for pond turtle conservation, we really have to consider what the impacts of sliders might be and how you might control those impacts. Um, so this is the waterway that our group worked in for a number of years. This is the Arboretum at the University of California Davis, kind of near Sacramento. Um, as you can see from the satellite image, it's a pretty urban uh, landscape surrounding it with the campuses to the north and south, um, as well as downtown Davis to the east. Um, the waterway is surrounded by two major freeways here, as you can see in the south and, and west side of the image. Um, but despite being a pretty heavily uh, developed landscape, um, this waterway is home to a pretty impressive and robust turtle community with over 100 Western pond turtles living there, including recruiting animals. So we have hatchlings um, in this waterway, um, but also a pretty sizable bowl of red ear sliders. We have, you know, at the point of uh, starting this study, uh, probably approaching 200 sliders in this one, one pond. Um, and then we use this waterway for a number of years, pre predominantly through Brad Schaefer's um, herpetology course to really give undergraduates a really good opportunity to study herpetology in the field, also to study some conservation relevant projects. Um, and we've learned quite a bit over the years about kind of the, the relative biological differences between sliders and Western pond turtles. Um, our team though was back in 2011, we're all getting ready to leave UC Davis for various places, including Brad. Um, and we had kind of one final opportunity to really test whether um, the sliders in this waterway were really having an Im impact on pond turtles using an experimental approach in the field. Um, so 2011, we embarked on a big experimental slider removal from this pond um, and spent the next year after that measuring the impacts on Western pond turtles. So let's take a look at what some of that data looked like. So over the course of a, a little over a month, we um, predominantly trapped but also hand captured um, and removed almost 180 red ear sliders from the single waterway. So think about 180 turtles from a single pond in about a month. It's a pretty impressive amount of animals to remove. Uh, that's equivalent to about 101 kilograms of turtle biomass or 220 pounds. Uh, for context, I weigh about 220 pounds. So it's kind of a, a max size pile of turtles we pulled out of one waterway in a single year. Um, and the graph here shows the trap day on the x-axis of our, of our effort. Um, on the y-axis is the percent total of all the removed sliders we had. And I show this mostly to show that the two curves for males and females here um, start to asymptote over about 20 to 30 day period, um, which tells us that we've actually removed the vast majority of the sliders in the population. Um, removing any aquatic species um, completely is really hard to do, but we did remove, we think, the majority of the turtles that were there. Um, and so if we were to, were to see a response in the Western pond turtles, uh, we think we did enough of a removal to see that response. So what might some of those responses look like? One of the big things that we really tested and saw, what we were excited about, was looking at body condition in pond turtles. Body condition, um, in this case, is um, body mass for pond turtles controlling for shell size. Um, and so what you see here on the graph is body condition on the y-axis. And then two different sets of dots um, here are the pre and post slider removal body condition measurements. Um, for 25 pond turtles, we caught immediately before and immediately after the removal, uh, about a year apart. Um, the black triangles are male pond turtles and the red circles are female uh, pond turtles. 
Um, so what you see here are changes in body condition across that year. Um, and some turtles obviously showed um, no change, some showed a slight decrease. Um, but in general, most of the pond turtles showed a pretty substantial increase in body condition um, about a year after we did the, the big slider removal. Um, and on average, it's about 40 gram increase um, in body condition for a given shell size. And that's actually a pretty impressive change in body condition, um, given that on average, our pond turtles were four to 600 grams up to 1,000 grams at most. So it's a pretty huge increase in four to 10% of their body mass um, in just a single year. Um, at the same exact time of year, um, both before and after the slider removal. So we do see that removing sliders had an impact on um, body condition. The other thing we really thought about was um, whether sliders were outcompeting uh, pond turtles or basking sites and shifting the basking behavior and basking site use of pond turtles. Um, and the Arboretum of Davis is pretty nice because it kind of uh, flows in kind of a, a west to east sort of gradient. Um, and along that west to east axis, we actually have a, a number of different environmental variables that also correlate nicely. Um, one of the big ones you really care about is human activity. So kind of uh, pedestrian and bike foot traffic or bike traffic um, on the walkway surrounding the, the waterway here um, with high levels of human activity towards the east end of the waterway and very low amounts of human activity towards the west end. Um, and there are a few other sort of viral characteristics that um, vary across this gradient too, um, which you can read about in the paper if you're super keen. So what do we see? Um, so here on the y-axis are the number of Emmys or pond turtles basking per day from our, our, our models. And on the x-axis here is the distance to the west end of the arboretum, um, uh, again, that west east axis. So uh, on, the, on the left side of the x-axis is the far west end of our arboretum, and you move towards the far east end or downtown Davis towards the east to the right-hand side of this graph. Um, and the black curve here is, ba is basking pond turtle um, distribution before the regular slider removal. So pretty obvious trend here um, where pond turtles are really concentrated in the west end of the arboretum and their basking distribution declines as you move, move further and further east where there are more people um, being active. So what happens when we remove sliders? Well, we see their basking distribution really, really dramatically changes. Um, pond turtles are, are no longer uh, concentrated um, in the west end of the arboretum. They're actually not concentrated anywhere. They show a pretty flat and even distribution across the waterway, which is pretty impressive to see this huge shift in basking um, all of a sudden. And one of the reasons we think this might be happening is that pond turtles are actually pretty grumpy um, turtles. They don't like basking near um, other anything really, other pond turtles or other sliders. And so um, by simply removing the density of uh, turtles in the arboretum, regardless of species identity, um, we may actually have allowed pond turtles to kind of flatten out their distribution and be a little more spread out like they prefer to do in the first place. Um, the thing you'll notice though is that the red curve here is much lower than the black curve. Um, and we actually saw uh, far fewer pond turtles using the basking sites that we have been monitoring. And so we actually think they were actually um, starting to use other areas of the arboretum they may not have been previously. It's kind of an unexpected result from removing uh, almost 200 sliders. And I won't really dwell on this for too long, but I really wanna show you also um, the residual slider basking distributions as well. So obviously we, we didn't remove all the sliders, but we removed um, the vast majority. So this is the same sort of graph we saw for pond turtles, but instead for sliders. Um, so the black curve here is the uh, red slider basking distribution across the arboretum. The black curve is before removed most of them. Um, so the opposite pattern of pond turtles. So they're actually concentrating the basking activity towards the far east end of the arboretum um, where humans are, are very active um, and kind of a decline towards the west. Though they're still pretty prevalent and abundant um, across the whole arboretum. Those sliders that are left, the red curve here, after the big removal though, um, are, is pretty fascinating to us. What we see is actually sliders abandon a ton of basking sites to the west and center, central part of the um, arboretum and really concentrate their basking activity to just a handful of sites to the far east. Um, the same places where they're already concentrated in their basking behavior before. Um, and kind of one of the fun insights from this, we think, is that the sliders were so dense here, so abnormally dense in the arboretum at Davis, um, that they actually had high levels of intraspecific competition where they were actually pushing each other out of them that were more preferred sites um, towards where the pond turtles happen to be. Um, so really an interesting dynamic we can only pick up really if we do um, these kinds of field experiments. So what are the kind of big takeaways from this? Um, the kind of question we get all the time is, is it even worth removing sliders? Um, kind of the short answer is uh, maybe, which is not really a satisfying answer. Um, one of the things that we treat on a lot is the fact that we had an extraordinarily high density of both sliders and pond turtles in this waterway. Um, and so some of the effects we may have seen maybe just simply due to um, cutting the density of turtles more or less in half, a little more than half, um, regardless of the actual identity of the species. Um, 
And so that may be some of what we're seeing here. It's not so much that sliders are a problem, but just there's too many mouths to feed, too many turtles basking um, in general. Um, kind of a more of a sociological effect that um, is going on also with any slider removal and some of the resistance we've seen in other locations that um, everyone loves turtles. We know that turtles are very charismatic. And so there's a lot of resistance to removing um, and inter interfering with sliders. Even the people can kind of uh, grapple with the fact that they're not native. Um, you can have a lot of folks who are pretty, pretty against you removing them. Um, in general. So that can be a really huge challenge to this. And something we actually um, felt when we were at the Arboretum, we got the, the police called on us a number of times, uh, even though we were kind of in our own backyards. Um, and one of the big ones, this is actually super expensive. It took us um, over 2,000 person hours, a small army of people over, uh, over a month of trapping to do this work, so a lot of labor. Um, and if you kind of calculate California Department of Fish and Wildlife um, scientific aid wages, it would have cost the state about $30,000 to do the same work for a single population of sliders to be removed. So um, very labor intensive, very monetarily expensive. Um, and part of this is kind of a, a slider removal is more or less all for naught if you don't actually send the flow. They're still very common in the pet trade, still very common in the food trade. Um, and it's been a few years now since we did the removal and there are a ton more sliders back in this waterway. So they're just kind of uh, actively being released all the time. Um, but one of the things we are really hoping with uh, publishing our results in this removal is to really encourage other folks to do this. To our knowledge, this is really the first um, field experimental removal of regular sliders um, out there. A lot of folks are doing removals, but I, as far as we know, monitoring the effects on the native species. So we really want to encourage folks to do that and share um, kind of some of our lessons learned. And one of the big ones we really wish we had done more of or had the chance to do more of um, is replication. And part of that is spatial replication. So having more ponds you're actively surveying at same, any given point in time, um, including control ponds that you don't remove sliders in. Um, but also ponds that differ in total turtle and slider densities, um, also doing some replication across time. So really gathering more before, before removal data and after removal data um, to see how much annual variation there is anyway in body condition and basking behavior um, to really tease apart the effects of sliders versus um, uh, just kind of annual variation. And one of the other kind of big things you know, people take away is to really expect the unexpected. The benefit of a, a laboratory and music cosmic experiment is that it's very controlled. So you can feel pretty confident that your treatments are having the effect. But in the field, other things are kind of going on. You get some unexpected results going on for sure. Um, for instance, we saw that pond turtles really reduced their overall basking behavior um, when sliders were removed, which is making it, making it kind of hard to figure out if they're shifting the distribution. Um, but it also helped us realize that maybe there's extraordinary amounts of intraspecific competition among sliders, um, which is interesting biologically, but also you know, helps us also understand that there's maybe an animal welfare problem going on with sliders as well. They aren't just impacting native species, but by releasing sliders into the wild, we're actually doing harm to those individual turtles as well. And I don't think no one likes invasive species, um, but we also don't like any animal being harmed. And so one of the kind of big things to think about is um, the messaging around not releasing sliders for their own good as well. So with that, um, I wanted to kind of hit home one last point, which is uh, my colleagues and I with the East Bay Regional Park District in the, in the Bay Area, as well as um, folks at the Santa Cruz County Land, Land Trust are replicating this work now in a couple uh, semi-urban ponds that have kind of moderate sized populations of sliders and pond turtles to get more of that spatial and, and temporal replication. I really encourage more folks to do this. Um, I would, of course, love to chat more with folks who are really keen on doing experimental slider removals. Um, with that, here are the two publications that I talked about um, here in this talk today. Um, uh, the PRJ paper, which is actually the removal paper, is free to access. It's open access. Um, and you can always shoot me an email to ask more questions. And with that, I will take any questions folks may have. And it looks like we may already have a question. Uh, assuming this isn't a closed system and future slider removals may be needed, um, idea how often removal would be needed at the Arboretum, which is a great question. So um, for pond turtles, we feel pretty confident this is a closed system. There is um, Pewter Creek is a neighboring area where there are certainly are pond turtles, but they kind of make a pretty big move across freeways um, and land to get to the Davis Arboretum. So we think that the pond turtle population is more or less closed. Um, but yeah, the slider population is certainly open population. and like I said, in the past eight or nine years, we've already seen a huge flow of turtles and we're actually looking to do another actual removal next year in the same place um, for this. My guess is if you're actually gonna do a slider removal and your goal is to keep the population low, it would be every two or three years doing a pretty intensive effort to keep all newcomers out. So um, I really hope that as a community of turtle biologists, we can maybe put some pressure on local uh, state and federal agencies to actually ban stem of these turtles um, in the pet and food trade. 
because that's really going to be more important than actually doing removals going forward. In California, there are certainly millions of sliders, and there's no way you can pull them all out or rehome them, and euthanizing them is just an ethical nightmare. Uh, second question, do you think that music cosmic experiments have anything to add to this work? If so, what would you like to see as an experimental design? Um, that's a really good question. So I opened up kind of talking about how there are problems with musicosm and lab experiments, um, but they also offer a lot of value and they do show um, kind of a more controlled setting. So I think in this case with something like pond turtles, um, it'd be really nice to actually do density experiments. So seeing how the relative abundance of pond turtles to sliders in, music, in musicosms um, might shape the probability of basking, where a pond turtle might bask and how much food they have access. So if you have one, tur one pond turtle to five sliders, how does that differ from five pond turtles to one slider? Um, we certainly have plenty of populations where uh, pond turtles outnumber sliders five or 10 to one. Um, and so it's not really clear if sliders matter when you have that many pond turtles outnumbering them. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think densities are really the, the, the big one to play with and the relative densities of the two species. Um, third question here is, are sliders in California mostly in lowland urban waters um, or how far do they occur in foothills or mountain waters? Um, that's a really great question. So some cool work by uh, Phil Spinks and Bob Thompson uh, a few years back now in the Sacramento Valley, um, River Valley, showed that the sliders are more or less restricted to urban areas. Um, and that's pretty much true where actually wherever you look, if you go on iNaturalist, you don't really find sliders in any sort of remote, remote rural or um, natural environments, um, at least not any uh, meaningful numbers. You do get them in agricultural landscapes in Central Valley and a little bit in the foothills as well. Um, and you'll find them in kind of more natural areas that are kind of uh, rural with a handful of people, um, but they are going to be mostly in, in urban places. Uh, so I think they weren't they aren't going to be a huge problem outside of that. Uh, question four is: Do you notice any impacts of the slider removal on habitat quality or other characteristics? Oh, this is uh, my favorite question. And I really wish we had measured it, and something we're doing now. So the year after we moved sliders, we went to the arboretum, and the water was absolutely crystal clear. Um, and a huge part of that, as any of you who ever seen a turtle in captivity knows, is turtles are disgusting. They are just huge eaters. They poop a lot. They're big nutrient cyclers. Um, I think just a simple fact of removing almost 200 turtles or a couple hundred pounds of turtle biomass, we removed a big source of nutrient cycling in this waterway, um, which just like minimized eutrophication. Um, we didn't quantify that, which is a bummer, but something we're doing now in the two projects I'm doing um, kind of replicate its work is look at the effects of sliders on ecosystems. We have some good theoretical work and a couple of good empirical studies on turtles generally. So they really should shape ecosystems and habitat quality um, in part because turtles with their shells have a huge phosphorus demand. So they should be pulling out phosphorus, which is a very limiting nutrient, um, but just they're also big eaters and poopers. And so um, if it, folks keep doing this further going, going forward, I would definitely encourage you to measure water quality um, and other sort of ecosystem processes. So my guess is there's a huge changes when you pull out lots of sliders. And kind of a, a fifth question we have is, have you found any other pet trade species released in the same waterway system? Excellent question. Um, when we were doing the removal, we actually pulled out something like a dozen uh, stink pot turtles, Thronothrus odoratus, um, two adults, a number of hatchlings that were right there on the arboretum. Uh, so those are not common in the pet trade, but they are in the pet trade. Um, so those are there. We pull out um, a painted turtle and a cooter, um, uh, pseudomies. Um, and um, when I was there, so Christmies Cry and pseudomies when I was back working there. Uh, but this, if you kind of look up a, a paper led by Phil Spinks, I think back in like 2008 or something like that, um, they'd done a prior removal of turtles in the same waterway. And they even found a bog turtle in there that was a... Uh, uh, from the east, eastern United States. So plenty of random things from all over the place have been in there. We had soft shell turtles. Um, so it's kind of a, a nice dumpster of turtles that people have from the pet trade that end up there. So um, it's a fun place. My guess is though that slider is based off their uh, numerical effect, but also kind of biomass effects are really the big players. So I th think that's uh, all the questions I have. And with that, I will uh, hang up and pass it on. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Just going to check that my mute is good. So my name is Kristen Petroff. I'm from Western Sydney University uh, in Australia. And today I'm going to be talking about distribution overlap between the critically endangered Bellinger River snapping turtle and an invasive species of short neck turtle. 
So just to give you a bit of an overview um, about these turtle species. So we have the Bellandrova snapping turtle, which is an endemic species uh, to the Bellandrum River. Um, I'm going to refer to it in this talk by its genus as my Achilles. And in 2007, the population was uh, regarded as seemingly healthy. Um, there was about, you know, 2000 individuals um, within the river system itself. However, in 2015, um, an unknown NIDO virus um, actually wiped through the population and killed about 90% um, of the historical population within about a seven week period. This virus has uh, since been deemed the Bellingham River virus. And at the time it, a prominent, it predominantly affected um, adult my Achilles. Today we have predominantly juveniles remaining in the river um, and population estimates suggest there's about 150 uh, individuals left. And I guess the point that we're looking at now is that we have a critically endangered species that is predominantly comprised of juveniles that have say five to 10 years to go in order to reach sexual maturity in order to replenish the population. So during that time, it's really important that we assess additional threats to the recovery um, of juveniles that do remain. One of those threats, which uh, is the topic of my PhD is the Murray River Shortneck Turtle, uh, Emidura macquarii. Now, I do wanna point out that Emidura is actually a native Australian turtle. Um, it's found in the Southeast uh, area of Australia and it is actually declining in its range. In the 1990s, however, it was introduced into the Bellingham River. And since then it has increased in numbers. Population estimates at the moment suggest that about 500 uh, Emidura inhabits the Bellingham River. Now the presence of Emidura in the Bellingham River actually poses a potential threat to the recovery of my Achilles. So the topic of my thesis is uh, looking at how these two species uh, potentially interact um, compete and hybridize um, and what role that potentially has um, in affecting my Achilles recovery. So to start off with, I wanted to look at how the abundances and distributions of our two species have changed uh, prior to the disease outbreak and after the disease outbreak. Um, the other question that we had as well is whether or not the two turtle species actually move similar distances or have similar home range size. So it's really important that we understand essentially how these two species overlap um, in order to understand the implications that this has for my Achilles recovery. Um, so essentially we compared catch per unit effort across years and sites. In particular, we used our 2007 data, which is when the population of my Achilles was seemingly healthy um, and Emidura were occurring in low numbers. We then had uh, the disease outbreak. And after that, we had more intensive monitoring um, of my Achilles and what was left in the river, it's, what was left in the river itself. So my Achilles in the current sampling period, this 2015 to 2019, they occur in low numbers and we have this switch to higher numbers of Emidura. So this graph here is essentially looking at distribution and abundance changes for my Achilles. Um, we have distance from the ocean uh, along our X axis and catch per unit along the Y. And what we're seeing is a severe reduction in the abundance of my Achilles predominantly due to um, the Bellinger River virus. What hasn't changed so much though is the distribution. So if you're looking at the red squares post disease, the distribution of my Achilles still remains relatively the same. We've just seen a massive reduction in the number of individuals. When we look at the same uh, distribution and abundance graph for Emidura, however, we see somewhat of the reverse. So the blue circles, which is pre-disease, um, this was uh, 2007 data, the number of Emidura in the river was quite low and they were quite sporadically distributed. When we look at post-disease data, um, we've actually found an increase in the abundance of Emidura in sections of the river system. In a downstream section in particular, around the 26 to 31 uh, kilometers from the ocean, there is a large number of in, uh, Emidura within uh, these set water holes. We looked more closely at the abundance of the turtles uh, within this section. And what we actually found is there's actually a high percentage of juveniles. So about 30 to 50% of the individuals that are actually being caught within this downstream reach um, are juveniles, which is indicative of successful recruitment occurring for Emidura. As um, other studies have pointed out, we know that turtles may only need uh, one in 10 good years of uh, good reproductive success in order to maintain a population. And for Emidura in this sense, um, this can be quite alarming for us when we're seeing solid recruitment uh, occurring. 
Uh, so our second question of whether or not they move similar distances or have similar home range size. So we used uh, recapture data and radio tracking and created minimum convex polygons to essentially compare the distance moved and the home range size across species and sexes. Uh, this is just a snapshot of some of the minimum convex polygons that we created. Uh, we found no significant difference between uh, Emijira and my Achilles in um, the amount of like, the distance that they moved. So they're both moving the same. Um, but what we did find is differences in the sexes. So males uh, for both sexes were found to move further than females and juveniles. And I do just want to point out that male Emijira in particular were found to move uh, quite far distances. So this graph on the top left hand side this male and Ujiro moved a substantial distance uh, upstream during the time of tracking. When we looked at our home range analysis, we found that and Ujiro actually have a greater home range size than my Achilles. I do want to point out though that we take this result with a bit of a grain of salt purely because we're dealing with differences in population uh, demographics. So for my Achilles, we're dealing with a predominantly juvenile based population, whereas for and Ujiro, we have uh, more adults which adults tend to move a little bit further than what the juveniles do. So because we have this overlapping distributions and we have similar movement occurring between the two species, um, it's really important to understand the interactions between the two in order to assess the threat of Amidura to our critically endangered my Achilles. Um, and two threats in particular are hybridization and diet competition. So the next two slides are just gonna go through some of the results that we found uh, for these two threats. Um, hybridization is occurring between these two species. Um, this uh, graph here is a PCOA analysis and that essentially maps individuals in space based on their genetic similarity. So our purple circles um, highlight pure Emidura and pure Maya Achilles. And when these two species mate, they produce what we refer to as F1 um, hybrids. It's kind of the same way as a donkey mating with a horse to produce a mule, except in our analogy of our F1 hybrids, um, they're actually not sterile. So they're actually able to produce um, offspring and actually mate back to one of the parental species to produce what we refer to as back crosses or intergressed individuals. Um, I guess we look at this scenario at the moment, um, we currently have juveniles in the population. So the occurrence of hybridization, we would assume would be quite low because they're not able to reproduce at the moment. But the issue becomes that when my Achilles does reach adulthood, um, what impact is it going to have when their numbers are so low that they may actually end up encountering more Emidura as opposed to a mate of their own species. So in five to 10 years time, we may actually see an increase um, in the threat of hybridization and the incidence of hybridization because my Achilles population numbers are low and they're more likely to encounter an Emidura instead. Um, then our results for um, overlap in uh, diet and competition. So I use stable isotope analysis to essentially look at um, overlapping trophic position between the two species at different sites along the river. Um, we calculated estimated trophic position based on uh, carbon and nitrogen isotopes found in claw samples for both the species and compared these across five different sites. At sites one and three, there was no overlap uh, in trophic position. So the two turtle species are foraging um, at different levels However, at site five in particular, um, there is substantial overlap in trophic position uh, between the individuals that we're catching there. And the other important thing about site five is that if you reflect back to that distribution uh, graph that we had earlier for Emidura, where there was a high abundance um, of Emidura and high percentage of juveniles within that downstream reach, um, this site five actually corresponds within close proximity to that area. So at this area in particular, we have a high abundance of turtles um, particularly for Emidura, um, and we have overlap in competition, which is really alarming when you're dealing with my Achilles that are still being caught there and what potential impacts does that have uh, for the growth rates um, and recovery of my Achilles. Uh, so just to give you a bit of a uh, overview and a bit of a conclusion into the implications um, of this overlap that we're experiencing, so hybridization, there's less chance of my Achilles encountering a mate as they reach adulthood. As I said, my Achilles at the moment, the population numbers are so low that they're more actually potentially likely to encounter any Jura than their own species. And because of this, there's potential for an increase in hybridization events to occur. We currently don't know whether or not this will 
actually happen for sure, but it is something that um, could be predicted for in the future. The other important thing as well is that if male and are involved um, in hybridization and the production of F1 hybrids, then there's potential that hybrids may actually spread purely because of male imagerous tendency to move further differences, further distances up and downstream. Um, so we're looking at mitochondrial DNA testing um, to actually test some of those F1 hybrids to see what the mother line is um, and essentially evaluate whether or not male imagera um, are involved in those hybridization events. And the conclusions for competition is that there is potential for competition to occur in some areas. The other thing as well is that because the two species overlap um, in distribution, it leaves very few areas for my Achilles to escape the competition pressure for, from Emigera. And I just want to leave you with this last thought is essentially what do we do about a native pest? So as I mentioned, Emigera in the Bellinger, um, there are invasive. However, Emidura in Australia are native. So it's really this question about whether or not we need to remove Emidura um, in order to promote the recovery of my Achilles. And I guess we kind of uh, tend to sit on the fence a bit with this because my Achilles itself could benefit from the removal of Emidura. You know, hybridization events in competition wouldn't occur. But at the same time, my Achilles is critically endangered. So if we do remove Emidura, are we actually going to end up losing uh, a turtle that potentially fills a really valid ecological role within the Bellingen system. And that's the end of my talk. So I just want to thank um, our partners and funding bodies. And I'm open for questions, which I've seen a couple come through. Okay, so question one, are you inferring F1 back cross status based on hybrid index score, that is the fraction of the genome of each species or the actual occurrence of heterozygous and homozygous. So we use uh, SNP uh, genotyping in order to look at F1 and backcross uh, status. Um, and I believe that that's with heterozygous and homozygous um, as opposed to the actual occurrence itself. So I hope that answers that for you. Uh, question two, are you looking at nidovirus in Emidura to see if they are carriers? I'm not personally, um, we do have a, another PhD student that is looking more in depth uh, into the virus itself. I'm not sure whether or not um, she's actually looking at whether or not they are carriers as part of her research, but it is something that has been considered uh, in discussion with our partners as well. Uh, the third question, is the virus still present and do the My Achilles juveniles have any chance of survival or maturity? Is Emidura not susceptible to the virus? So at the time of the disease outbreak, there weren't any Emidura uh, noted as being um, succumbing to the virus itself. Um, whether or not it's still present, um, teams at Taronga are taking swab samples um, in order to test whether or not individuals are still shedding the virus. And I guess this question about whether or not my Achilles juveniles are going to become susceptible when they reach adulthood it's unknown. We don't know whether or not um, they will succumb to the disease. And it's kind of that thing of, you know, ensuring that we can get them there in a healthy state so that they may be able to be um, less susceptible when they do get there. Is there any more that we have? We'll wait just a second to see if we do get one more. But thank you, Kristen. This is very important research. And thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you. Um, I don't believe we have any more questions. Looks like it. Thank That's you. All. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you, all of our presenters from today. A lot of great stuff. And everyone who joined us. And be sure to join us next week on Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And our sessions are gonna be field studies of conservation action and some more from the field. So tune in then and we will see you then.